Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle McNichol. We're going to get started here today. I'm general counsel and the director for the Center of Leadership. I want to just take a brief moment um, because I know we're kind of going to be moving rather quickly through this. Um, but you guys are really in for a treat today. We have an esteemed panel of experts today, and I really want to give them a quick hand to thank them for taking the time today for us. <laughs> So as you'll see on the information that was passed out to you, uh, you'll be able to follow it on live stream. We'll have our Twitter hashtag, as well as the website and presentation materials will be available to you. And after these proceedings have been completed, we'll have those uploaded and available for you as well. So it'll be archived there. One sort of, um, I'm going to call it a housekeeping item. I want to thank the folks from Apple Walnut Cafe for providing us with the wonderful treats that we have out there. Uh, they provide those to us as part of the Center for Leadership and the opportunity for the ongoing community service that we do provide through these. The second piece has to do with the wardrobes for work. I want to thank all of the folks who have participated in providing us with over 5,000 pieces of clothing, professional clothing that have been turned over. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. We, can, we will be uh, kicking off our fall uh, actual collection and we'll be putting our bins out in t again to uh, sponsored and uh, to companies that will be providing uh, space to us and be doing collections. Uh, we have many that are listed on our website and we have many more to come. So we're very excited about that. Uh, so far we have placed over 1,000 pieces of clothing with different individuals in the community. And we'd like to continue to do that. So if you know of a community group that's in need or individuals that are in need, please feel free to contact me at the information that's contained here and we'll ha be happy to coordinate having them come in to be provided with the wardrobe as well. So I'm sorry, that was my public service announcement piece. We will be passing around for everyone during the Q&A period uh, cards. Just raise your hand and I'll be happy to uh, shoot you a card so you have questions that you would like to um, ask this esteemed panel. So at this time, I would like to introduce to you Mike Nylon. Uh, Mike has been with Bellevue Communications. He is their vice president and I'm just Vice President of Media Relations. Before joining Bellevue, Mike spent nearly 20 years with 6ABC. As planning editor for 6ABC, he worked with producers, reporters, photographers, and news executives to arrange and execute all local news coverage. During his time at Channel 6, he helped to spearhead the station's coverage of the Democratic National Convention, Pope Francis' visit, the Jerry Sandusky scandal, the 2015 Amtrak train derailment and the center city building collapse at 22nd and Market Street. At this time, I'd like to welcome Mike Nylon. Folks, thanks for, um, thanks for coming out uh, this morning. Um, Danielle's right, we, we have an esteemed uh, panel today to get uh, all these news directors and, and um, you know, news managers here in, in one setting is, uh, is difficult. As you can see, they're all uh, uh, attached to their iPhones, uh, checking emails and the latest breaking news. So if they, if they have a little bit of a tick, um, you, you'll understand why, because they're not in that newsroom uh, buzzing. And uh, I have that same uh, feeling. Uh, I just left the newsroom about six months ago and uh, landed on the PR side. And uh, it, it's been a learning experience from the get-go. And uh, I miss my friends and colleagues over here to the, uh, on, on the stage. And, um, but but we're, we're, we have a great panel. But, so let's start it off. We have um, Phil Heron is um, the executive editor of the uh, Daily Times. And uh, most of you folks know Phil and, uh, and all his accomplishments. He's won numerous awards. But, and I can't do it justice uh, uh, talking about his bio. So uh, let me introduce Phil, and he can talk about uh, who he is, what he does, and, and, and what's his passion. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming out. Uh, it's really, really nice to get an opportunity to get out of the office even if I can't get away from this uh, for too very long. Down, down. Uh, one of the things that I, just speaking completely personally and for myself, I kept hearing everyone saying, talking about a distinguished panel, and I kept thinking to myself, what time does he get here? <laughs> uh, I am, in fact, the, uh, the editor of the Daily Times here in Delaware County. 
producing both a daily newspaper and a daily website uh, basically is what we do. We focus obviously tremendously here on Delaware County. But uh, every time that I go out to uh, speak to a group, I, I tell them uh, a couple of things about myself that uh, I think hold true and basically are responsible for who I am and what I do. And one is, without question, the house that I grew up in, uh, where my parents simply would never even consider the prospect of starting a day without consuming, if not several, at least one daily newspaper. And then uh, maybe a, a, an experience that some of you may have had, uh, and that is for the first eight years of my education experience, I had the, I'll use my uh, quote marks here, the honor and distinction of sitting at the fairly firm right hand of the sisters servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So yes, I can diagram a sentence like nobody's business. <laughs> but my math and science skills may not be uh, what they probably should be, but that is much more my fault uh, than theirs. And then third, and I, to, the, to the young people that are, are here, uh, I would highly suggest that if you ever get this opportunity to please take full advantage of it. And that is for the first two years of my college experience, I had the distinction and honor of attending classes at Lincoln University. Now, when I tell people that, especially when I'm speaking to adults, I see sometimes they cock their head a little bit and they look at me and I sort of stand there knowing full well they are dying to ask me a question, which is why would some people might have considered it maybe a little odd for me to have attended Lincoln University? Well, Lincoln University is one of the nation's oldest, most prestigious, most acclaimed, most honored, most revered institutions of higher learning traditionally dedicated to the education of African American students. I get to put on my editor's cap now and simply say what we said on campus, the Harvard of black schools. Yeah? So what? So why is that important? Ooh, uh, I'll tell you exactly why that's important. Look around this room, please, and tell me what you see. You see just about exactly what I saw almost every day growing up in a little town of Oxford, PA, way out in the southern end of Chester County. You see a whole lot of faces that look just like this face. And that was always your experience. You were always the majority. And then I walked into a classroom in Lincoln University, sat down, looked around, and realized this was the only face in that room that looked that way. If you ever get that opportunity, do yourself a huge favor and grab it with both hands. We would be light years away from the same problems we are struggling with today at Cabrini University and Charlottesville, Virginia, at Georgia Tech, people had that small sliver of experience. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm here to uh, answer any questions that, uh, that you have, and I'll give it back to Mike. Uh, next up on the stage is uh, Anzio Williams. Anzio is the uh, vice president of news uh, for both NBC10 and Telemundo 62. He joined NBC back uh, in July of 2012 and has been the news director there uh, since they formed that duopoly uh, in 2012. Uh, we're happy to have him here today, and I'm sure Comcast executives are probably happy to have him here that he's not spending a ton of money. <laughs> but I spoke to him this morning. He's dropping people around uh, the world, even as we speak, uh, trying to cover some of the serious issues that are going on out there with, with Hurricane Jose. And uh, he, too, is attached to his iPhone, making sure that his people are, are safe uh, covering the news. But, Angio, uh, I can't do your uh, bio justice. So uh, why don't you talk a little bit about yourself? And I, I know you're embarrassed about that, but, but, but please have at it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, good morning. Uh, I do, uh, I'm the vice president of news for the NBC and, and Telemundo stations in the Philadelphia area, that would be NBC 10, Telemundo 62. Uh, what does that mean? I oversee the day-to-day -day operations of uh, the both television stations, uh, English and Spanish, and I also oversee our digital products. It will be our website, app, uh, social media, 
uh, no, I do not speak Spanish. <laughs> uh, and so a lot of people always ask, you know, how, how do you, I do have uh, lieutenants that are right under me uh, that oversee each, each one of those. And, and I'm always proud to say that uh, the three lieutenants who are right under me are all ladies, strong ladies, and uh, that, that can handle their business and handle me every day. So, uh, so I'm, I'm always proud to, proud to say that and that idea of valuing uh, not only diversity, but contrast. Uh, before Philadelphia, uh, I was running uh, uh, two stations in, in the Sacramento, uh, Northern California uh, area. Before that, uh, I was a, a newsroom leader in New Orleans, uh, where uh, I was able to uh, experience uh, Katrina uh, firsthand. Slept in my office for 32 days. Uh, before that, I was uh, assistant news director, news director at the NBC station in Orlando, before that I was in Charlotte, Cincinnati, Miami, Greensboro, and Durham. Uh, and he still has a suitcase packed, right? right, right. It, uh, <laughs> where, where's, where's the next stop? Yeah, and the funny thing is when you move and they put those little stickers on your furniture, and they always come to my house and it's like, how many stickers do you already have? Like, <laughs> they're trying to find like another color that it hasn't been used before. Uh, so, uh, but listen, I, I, I'm a, a journalist uh, at heart and uh, by training. Uh, I'm a graduate uh, journalism major from uh, North Carolina <coughs> A&T uh, in North Carolina and uh, ultimately uh, my craft is writing. And as I tell the rest of the folks in the newsroom, if the whole management thing doesn't work out, I know I can outwrite all of them. <laughs> so uh, so that, that is my story. Uh, next up is uh, Marianne Vaughn, uh, a, a Delaware County native and, and proud of her, her roots here. She is the assistant uh, news director at uh, Fox 29. Thank you. I guess I'm considered a, lo a lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs>
I was one of Mike Jarrett's producers for the morning show. And so I don't know if you guys know him, but um, you never know what's coming out. <laughs> and so it was the best experience of a lifetime because you never knew. It prepared me for so many other experiences and taught me so much. And then one day, somebody gave me the opportunity to be a manager, and then I felt like, oh, now we can talk about the news. And so that's where I feel like my strength is, because my news philosophy is do the news that people care about. How does it impact people? Let's talk about it. Let's not just say, okay, these are the three stories everybody thinks important. Now tell me why you think that's important. And so in a nutshell, that's my philosophy. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, next to Marianne is the uh, audio news director of WHYY Radio, Eugene Son. Um, don't hold this against him, but he's a uh, fellow uh, New Englander and uh, a huge uh, Boston Red Sox uh, fan. We're both uh, Red Sox Nation. Hey, Eugene, I don't know if you, we, we won last night, won nothing over Baltimore in the 11th. So, uh, but don't hold that against him. But Eugene is a, uh, a pro and uh, why don't you talk about your journey through the media landscape? Sure. Uh, I actually came to this region originally for college. I'm a proud graduate of Swarthmore College here in Delaware County. And uh, the, upon graduation, I left for a couple of years. I worked at a small station in upstate New York and was able to land a reporting job back at WHYY in fall of 1998, covering the New Jersey State Capitol in Trenton. Um, which is a shared position between us and another public radio station in New Jersey that still, we still have that position, someone else does it now, uh, Phil Gregory. Uh, and I worked there on that beat for about nine years. Uh, left, I'd kind of gotten, as you can, if you stay on the same beat too long, I got, I got a little burned out. It felt like, to some degree, there were stories I was writing that like, I could just like, take last year's script and kind of change a couple of names. And, so I left and did some freelance work for a couple of years and kind of accidentally fell into news management. The WHYY had a, had a news director depart and they did a search and they had someone all ready to hire and then that person got cold feet at the last moment. And a lot of other news managers will tell you when you have an opening that high up, there's a certain amount of time you can go along without someone officially at the helm and other people are taking jobs on in addition to what they normally do. But they had kind of, hung on long enough and they felt they couldn't do it. So they called me up since I had a history with the station and said, how would you like to come in and do this for a couple months while we do one last search? And if, and if you like it, you can throw your hat in the ring. And because I had been doing freelancing and because there were some other things that were going on and uh, change in my home life, it was actually a great opportunity. So I, I, I figured, well, worst case scenario, I would get a couple of months of steady work and then go back to what I was doing. And then I found I loved it because as a manager and as news director, you can have your hand in so many more stories than you can as a reporter. And I find that immensely rewarding in terms of ha being able to help improve our approach or our, our finished product in one way or another, a lot of different stories in the course of the day. And of course, you get to order people around, so that's not bad either. <laughs> uh, and I've been doing this since uh, April of 2010. Uh, at this point. And for those of you who aren't familiar, WHYY, we're the PBS and NPR station here. I would stay, still say the number one thing that people identify us with is Sesame Street. <laughs> uh, but you know, we, we also, you know, for example, right now we're running this Ken Burns series on Vietnam uh, in, on PBS. We're an NPR member station, so national and international news plus our local and regional news from WHYY on the radio at 90.9 or streaming online. And one thing that is uh, a challenge for us is the, we have a regional audience, like most of, most of the people up here, but so many of the people who work for me right here in Philly, and so one of the things that I, I've commuted from Langhorne out in Bucks County, and one of the things over the time I've been there is helping stretch my people in terms of covering places like Delaware County, Bucks County, Chester County, places in South Jersey, that they don't have personal connections to, but covering in a way that they're not just necessarily parachuting in and coming in and, and trying to redo a story that was done in, in Phil's paper. You know, trying to, you know, when big story breaks, we go and cover it wherever it may be, but also trying to build connections in those places. 
uh, so that way we're doing more original reporting that covers them and not all be just Philly-centric. Next to uh, Eugene, thank you, Eugene, is uh, uh, Steve Butler. And Steve is the uh, News and Programming Director at uh, KYW News Radio. And uh, Steve uh, mentioned to me he's been at the station for probably uh, over 20 years in, in, into the 70s. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Steve, talk about your vast experience and your, your journey uh, out, it, it, to, to, to today. Um, John Me Sonny worked for me, by the way. I'm glad I did. <laughs> Five minutes an hour, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I started at KYW in 1978 as a desk assistant, which is the lowly job you're getting coffee, somebody's lunch. Ripping wires, we had wire services back there. Take care of all that. Um, tomorrow is the uh, 52nd anniversary of KYW going all news. So I like to give my uh, current job description of I'm the guy uh, that uh, basically is uh, I don't screw it up. That's my job description. <laughs> uh, obviously, a heritage radio station known around not only just around the country but known around the world. We have a odd demented audience in Scandinavia because our signal skips over to Scandinavia. I can't explain it. They, they stay in touch with us. They'll send us air checks. Oh, this is what you sounded like tonight in Scandinavia. Right, it's great. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gotten sort of old and crotchety about a lot of stuff. Uh, you'll probably hear some of that today. Uh, I love what I do. Not just, and one of the reasons I love it is it's not just news. Um, the way it works in radio, uh, I'm also kind of the brand manager, if you will, for the station. So I get involved in a lot of things in addition to the news. Uh, it's still my favorite part, but I get involved in you know, the promotion of the station, uh, what things I will uh, allow the sales department to sell, and they're pretty good about letting me have a say in that, which they, would, didn't really, they wouldn't have to do that, but they do. Uh, so it's, it makes it a really cool job. Uh, back when I started in, uh, as a manager at the station, uh, I was, I was, I've worked at the station four different times. This is the fourth time, 20 years, I guess this is it. Um, so, you know, it was basically worrying about, you know, two, you know, metal towers in White Marsh uh, sending electromagnetic radiation out into the, uh, into the universe, Scandinavia. Um, but uh, now it's so many things. And that's a, obviously for a guy my age, it's like, you know, it's, it's constant, always something new. There's always a new meaning about something new. You know, we, I'm, I'm advertising a new app this week that we launched. Uh, you know, uh, we're on the internet, we're here, we're there, we're on an FM HD sub channel that nobody's listening to. So yeah, I mean, all these things that are, that are happening, uh, is, it makes the job really interesting, but crazy, because you're uh, trying to, it's literally like managing sort of an op octopus-like environment, but uh, I really like it. And the best part of the job for me uh, has always been and continues to be the people, uh, just to see uh, journalists kind of grow uh, in the job is really uh, very rewarding to me, the most rewarding part of the job. And uh, as we talk about growth, uh, next next guy up is uh, Steve McKenzie. And uh, Steve is the managing editor at uh, CBS3. And um, previous to that, Steve and I sat 30 inches apart from each other at uh, Channel 6. And, um, you know, he's just a wonderful uh, human being and is passionate about uh, the news business. And uh, Steve, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, Steve McKenzie. I uh, grew up five minutes down the road here in Aspen, Delaware County. When I was 18, I worked at an Amico station in the middle of Aspen, and I now as a fact. <laughs> and I remember I, we had full service, and we had the regular, and I was doing full service, and there was this gentleman there. Came up and he had an NBC hat on. So I spoke to him for a little bit and I checked his oil and I washed his windows. And I asked him, well, what do you do? And he said, well, actually, I'm a radio host at a radio station in Aston. I said, I grew up here my whole life. Where's this radio station? And his name was John Linder. Excuse me. He's the former mayor of Chester. Um, so he gave me his car and I called him. And he befriended him, the nicest guy in the world, brilliant. And he had a weekly radio show called All About Chester, 1590 WPWF in Aston Mills on the Big Hill. So I was 18 at the time, and he brought me on, and I was his producer for the show. So I was also the guy who was putting in the commercial, those, what it was, looked like eight tracks, remember that scene? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So it for the show, but it was syndicated. And uh, but every afternoon, I was there for two years. Every afternoon, we would have traffic reporters. Uh, Robin Rieger would call in, and John Brown would call in, and uh, they would. Uh, I would tape them doing the traffic report, and then I would put it in the afternoon draft, like a couple minutes after they did. So I'd be friends with them. And I got really interested in what they were doing, and I wanted to, you know, grow in the business, obviously. So there was a job opening at Metro Traffic, and it was, I think, $6 an hour, and I would have to drive to yeah. Northeast Philadelphia <laughs> Airport every morning. I think it was 4 a.m. 4 or 4.30 a.m., take off in a little Cessna one-engine plane and drive around the Philadelphia area, or fly around the Philadelphia area doing traffic reports. And then drive home at 9 a.m. and then go back in the afternoon at 3. So it was a kind of a commute when you live in Delta. <laughs> so I did that for a while and then moved to the inside of traffic, where I really got to know scanners, police scanners and how to listen for different things on police cameras. We were partnered when I was at Metro with Fox and with NBC. So when I would hear something, and I would hear something that was interesting, I would, my job was to call the TV stations and tell them what I you know, just heard and make sure that they heard and make sure that they had the information so I can friend with them. And then I got a job at Fox because I knew all of them because I was tipping them off with the information I heard at the scanners and all the traffic reports. So I became an assignment editor at Fox. That's when I worked with Mary Ann. She's a great lady. <laughs> um, and I was there for three years, and you know I learned a lot about the television, uh, um, you know, the whole business at, on the assignment desk there. I wanted to move on. So I did. I went to West Palm Beach and I was there in 2004 for the butterfly bat. And that was crazy. And then we got hit with Hurricane Francis, Hurricane Jean, and Hurricane Ivan, I think it was, and Charlie on the same day. So I was done with that. Left there because hurricanes are crazy. And I worked with Mike Neal for 10 years after that on the assignment desk at the city of Um Mike taught me a lot. And I learned a lot. The one thing that I learned that was the most important in my whole career is everyone you meet and everyone you speak with, is speak to, treat with respect. When you speak to that person, you will know a little bit more about that person. When you talk to them a little bit more, you'll get a little bit more. Not everybody in this world is a source, but everybody that you meet is a resource. Because if I'm doing a story down the line, I remember speaking to that person. And I remember that that person connected to that story. Maybe I can call that person and that person can help me with this story. And then I can advance the story and the story will be, look even better because I personalized that story with the person who's already involved with Because I spoke to that person before and I already know that they're involved. So treat and really learning about other people gives me a big advantage in stories that I'm putting together and stories that I've done before, because I can always go back to that person. So from working with Mike for 10 years, I moved on to um, CBS <coughs> as managing editor. Uh, my day starts out by calling up, saying, hey, what's going on? First thing I said. And they tell me what happened on the overnight. They tell me what uh, plans are for today. I come in, we have an editorial meeting where I sit down with all of our reporters, all the producers, the news, this, uh, the news director, um, and all the executive producers. We figure out what's going on. We find out what's more important to you and what you want to see and how this affects your life. Uh, my wife was yelling at me the other day because she didn't know what to do with the Toys R Us gift cards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for the first 24 hours, and I'm like, oh, all right, well, we have to do it. <laughs> you know? But it's just <coughs> things that you care about. 
That's what I care. Thanks, Steve. And as you can see, all of these folks have, uh, you know, earned uh, their positions. They've all eaten their fair share of ramen noodles and soup out of a can because when you start in this business, it is so unbelievably competitive. And um, to start in a small market making peanuts and then to finally graduate and come to a major market like Philadelphia uh, is quite an accomplishment. And the fact that these guys do it with, uh, with passion and more importantly, compassion is, um, is great for folks like you in the, uh, in the PR world and, and advocates and so forth. But look, to make this interactive and to make this work and you have access to some of the greatest minds in, in local TV and in local print and radio news, you know, we need some questions from you guys out there, and, and they're here, and they have a short amount of time to be here because they're, they're, they're all so very busy. So if you could slide your, your, your cards down, we can have you guys uh, have some of your questions answered uh, this morning. But I, I'll start that off. Um, you know, look, I, I, I'm just interested in, in, uh, in hearing, you, you know, your thoughts and views. I, I guess what, what is a great story uh, that'll drive uh, viewers and listeners um, for your particular, uh, or, or readers for that matter as well, Phil. Sorry about that. You're giving me the evil eye. Um, <laughs> for your particular uh, medium. So let, let's start down the other end of the table. Steve, why don't we start with wh what's a great story for CBS3? Mm. Wow. Uh, great story for CBS3. I, I really like the stories that not only connect with people on each story. I mean, a lot of people, the one thing they say that they hate about local news, and you'll hear it time and time again, is, oh, it's all this crime. It's all these fires. Well, you know what? If somebody was shot, or they were shot and killed, or their home burned down, I don't care who it is or where they live. That affects that community. That had an effect on those people. So if you can tell the people story, instead of just saying, oh yeah, look at the flames at this fire on this street. Oh, okay, people know that's in their neighborhood. But tell me about the woman who lost everything. If you can tell me her story, as far as making good TV and good stories for TV or print, Phil, that's what makes it. You gotta make me care about the people. Everybody cares about those people. Well, I guess I can be a little more parochial than most, and I can answer your question real easily, Mike. In our instance, first and foremost, it's got to be, we're going to focus on Delaware County. So I get questioned all the time about my you know, decision-making process and what goes into putting together this front page every day. And I can tell you that inevitably, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's gonna be a story focusing on something that's happening here in Delaware County. That's, that's what we do, that's our, our bread and butter. Uh, certainly we'll cover and touch on a lot of other things, or we may react to things. Today we'll be looking for people from the, uh, the county who have ties to Puerto Rico to see how they're uh, either people that might be there or have relatives there or grew up there. Uh, but it always, for us, has to tie back into Delaware County. I, um, I really hate crime stories. I really do. Um, we have a rule in our newsroom, which is basically, uh, if we're not going to remember the crime story tomorrow, then let's not do it today. Uh, and I think a lot of the crime stories that get done uh, are of that ill. However, as was pointed out, I think there are ways to do certain crime stories um, that will uh, you know, stick with people. Uh, I think one of the best TV packages I ever saw was, unfortunately not in Philadelphia, but it was in another market, was um, somebody who, uh, a reporter, uh, who went to a basic crime story, somebody was shot, uh, and noticed that there were kids, like, as, a, as the scene was there, there were all these kids kind of watching what was going on, and she decided, maybe she should do a story about these kids who are sort of watching what's going on in, in, in their neighborhood, got permission from the parents, interviewed them, and made this amazing story. 
Uh, and the second thing that was amazing about the package is you never saw the reporter. She left it all up to the kids. She never did the stand up in the, in, the, in the whole thing. It was one of the best things I ever saw, actually, in terms of crime. But I, I'm really hesitant about crime stories, uh, especially, I guess, me on the radio. I don't know. Especially when it's like a police blotter kind of thing. I mean, I've been known to call on the weekend and say, you know, knock it off. I think, no, stop it. <laughs> you know, let's do something else. Anybody else want to touch it or you want to, uh, you know, keep moving? Just raise your hand. If, you, if, if anybody wants to ring in, I mean, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll go ahead. Eugene? One of the things that I find is sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised by what stories really resonate with people. Uh, you can't say the words tomato juice in our shop without getting groans because sometimes somebody did, we have a health and science show called The Pulse. It's Friday mornings at 9 if you haven't listened before. And they did this story that why is it that people more often drink tomato juice when they're on a plane, and there's actually science behind it in terms of things that you're, you're, how your body's affected in flight. And it was one of those things that, like, I, when I initially heard the pitch, it was like, who cares? I don't, you know, like, and, but it was something that did phenomenally well in terms of how many people shared it, listened to it, et cetera. And then there was another example of a story that I thought, one I did personally back when I was a reporter that I thought was going to be a nothing little story. It was about a local software guy who was developing a web browser to aid people who have, or are blind or visually impaired. And did this little story. I thought it was a fine little story. The impact that had and the number of people who called in, partially because we're a radio station and people who have problems with their eyes are more reliant on radio for news. It, it touched a lot of people in terms of like, oh my goodness, I, you know, I'm really having trouble in terms of getting online because of my, my vision, et cetera. So I feel like there are, sometimes it's stories that you do because you think there's a, there's a worthwhile doing, but you don't understand how much it's going to impact people. It could be in a kind of novelty way in terms of tomato juice. It could be in a way it really touches people's lives in terms of the people with seeing problems, being able, not being left out of the online world. So I, I feel like those stories of that sort that I feel like are not the one that everybody else is chasing, but could really affect people one way, either just in terms of a, a, something I really want to share with my friend or my neighbor, or something that really affects their lives. Those are the things that really get me excited. Yeah, so now that we do podcasts, you get to see what the most downloaded stuff is. The most downloaded podcast last month, which scared the heck out of me, was uh, the, I guess it was this new, law, new uh, regulation in Pennsylvania where they'll interlock your car for a lower So all these people wanted to know about that law, which scared me because I guess they're, they want to know because they're running around drunk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but that, that, those are the kind of things. You never, that was a surprise to me. So that, that was such a popular story. I had to convince the reporter to do it in the first place because I thought it was a story, but it was proven that, wow, a lot of people were really interested in that. We're at a fine university today. I mean, uh, what, a, what a gorgeous day out there. What a gorgeous campus. I know some of you haven't been here in years, or this might be your first trip to, to Newman University. Um, but one of the students out there uh, had a question about uh, their majoring in communications, and they're wondering what advice can you guys offer as they head into this, uh, this landscape. And let's start with Anzio. Anzio, you've been around the world and back at a number of stations. So talk about the journey and what advice you'd give people to, that are going to start out in this field. You know, my first advice is uh, take advantage of this wonderful campus that you're on. This is my first time, and, and uh, I took a sneak peek into the studios, radio, television studio. The facilities here are, are fine quality, uh, top-notch facilities. So you have to start taking advantage of what's at your fingertips. So, um, so if I was a student here and I wanted to get in TV or any type of media, I would, you know, you can you can get all the hands-on experience, you know, that you want right here. You know, in your four or five, however many years you spend here, make sure you, you're really taking advantage of it. Uh, I got my first job through an internship, and, uh, and I remember my college professor saying, don't leave until they hire you. <laughs> 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 and so my first internship was the beginning of my, you know, in between the freshman and summer year, I was interning, and, uh, and at the end, I, I just kept going. I just kept showing up and taking my badge and everything, but I just kept showing up. And, and, uh, and finally, I was, you know, learning how to write, and eventually, an overnight uh, job came open, uh, working the assignment desk. And so, uh, in my sophomore year, I was 
going into work at midnight. When most kids are, you know, out doing whatever kids do these days. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to work. I would get off at 7.30 in the morning, stop by a little breakfast place, uh, eat, and go to class. And um, uh, I was, uh, I went from being an assignment editor. Uh, I would work overnight with the producer. Uh, the producer was responsible for writing and putting together the newscast. And all of our parents told us, you know, uh, dress, prepare yourself for the job that you want, not the one that you have. So I would just, he, I was like, hey, can I write this story? Hey, can I do this? So he taught me how to write. He taught me how to uh, edit. And uh, eventually I was doing his job. I was doing it. He would come in and watch me do it. And, um, and one day he didn't come to work. He didn't show up to work, and I just did. I was used to doing his job. I was just doing it, and all of a sudden it was like after the newscast, I realized he didn't show up to work. Second day, he didn't come to work. Third day, I remember, you know, overnight, three o'clock in the morning, the door opened up, and I thought it was him, and uh, it wasn't. It was the boss. And he was like, "Where's Bill at?" I was like, "I don't know. I haven't seen him in a couple of days." Long story short, he ended up giving me Bill's job. Bill had quit. And didn't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I see his name in the phrase every now and then. I haven't, I haven't spoken to him lately, you know, since he left. But I was just go to show you that. Listen, I, I am, a, you know, I, I think I am a product of uh, hard work and being in the right place at the right time, uh, getting to places early. Some of the same things we've heard all of all of our lives. I, I would say I'm certainly a, a, a product of that. Um, you know. People still ask me uh, over the weekend, it's like, hey, boss, what are you doing here? I was like, hey, I work here. Uh, so uh, every day I go in, uh, like it's my first day, and it could be my last, uh, and, and, and I won't be out work. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just how, you know, how I feel. And then I look at what we do uh, in, 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 as our industry, and, and I truly believe it's about service, and that's how I look at it. As journalists, uh, no different from law enforcement, we have to be in the business of servicing people and providing a good service to folks. And if that service is, is a value, you'll be successful. Phil, let me have you talk about that question because, you know, the newspaper industry is under an extreme amount of pressure. Uh, I was going to say, uh, I'm a little bit of a different animal here, not only, I guess, because I'm probably much older than uh, most of the people here at the, uh, at the table, but I am, in fact, in the, uh, in the newspaper industry. Uh, I, I would say to the students who are here, who are looking to go out into the industry, maybe print, maybe online, maybe broadcast, uh, I would tell you two words, brace yourself. Uh, we are, as an industry, probably somewhat under a top, not terribly differently than we have been for many, many me years, although now we call it uh, things like uh, fake news and whatever, but there was always a saying, uh, don't believe everything you read in the paper. Well, let me update that for you just a little bit. All those things you hear about the newspaper industry, believe all of them. It is a very, very difficult business atmosphere right now, but I would not let that discourage you in any way, and I would offer a couple of pieces of advice. One is you have something right now that you may not realize, but is incredibly valuable. And it is something that I do not have, and it is something that I could not buy, even if I was lucky enough to hit one of these Powerball jackpots that I consistently keep blowing all my money on. And that is you have time. I have no time. I have gone from a business which geared itself towards a single nightly deadline to a atmosphere where right now is my deadline, and then five minutes from now, and then, hey, we just got photos from the scene, so we can update that. We, in fact, do now, in addition to creating this lovely thing, we still kill a lot of trees every day, and I'm really proud of that. But we do, in fact, deliver information 24 hours a day. So I would ask you or plead with you, if you have an interest in getting into this business,
to practice what you preach. Right. Right every day. I don't care. Well, I probably do care, but I, write anything that you want. Write a journal. Write a blog. Write an email, okay, I'm not sure that email and texting isn't going to be the death of the English language, at least the one that I practice, but do that. Also, do something else. Now I'm going to tell you exactly how old I am. Please tell me that there are a few people in the room who are familiar with, and maybe once actually held in their hands, something called a slinky. Everybody know what a slinky is? <laughs> You have a slinky in your hands, and it goes like this, and it goes back and forth, and then when you get really creative, you can make it go down the steps, which is always kind of neat. What you should consider that image and use it this way. It's not a slinky. It is what I call the two Bibles of the news industry, and that is the core talent, which is writing. But I don't know anyone, I've never met anyone who is worth a damn as a writer who wasn't something else, and that is a voracious reader. So think about the slinky. This is your reading over here, and then you juggle it, and then it goes over there. That is writing. Email. This is the inbox where you're reading. This is the outbox where you're writing. Take advantage of the time that you have. Make sure that you are writing, and consider doing something else. If by chance, some miracle happens and somewhere down the road we are actually hiring people again, that piece of paper that you have probably got you into my office. It is, you know, one of those tired old cliches of the newspaper industry that we probably have moved beyond. I wouldn't say that I wouldn't hire someone who didn't have a college degree, but it would probably be unlikely. <laughs> but the truth is, that piece of paper got you into that chair. But equally true is, I don't particularly care what you did in college. I'd be much more impressed by you coming into my office and saying, Mr. Heron, yeah, I got a degree in journalism, but these are the clips of the things that I did for my weekly newspaper in the summer back home that uh, I published. These are the things that I did outside of the classroom. One of the great secrets of the newspaper business is people really have no idea what happens to stories after they're submitted by reporters. Reporters don't write the headlines that are on their stories. They take most of the abuse for them. I'm the person who has written a lot of them, and I know that uh, they have stood up for me in a lot of times. But please, take advantage of the time that you have. And one other thing, just for kicks, because I'm sort of a masochistic kind of guy. The next time you get an assignment in class or whatever, don't sort of say, uh, when the mood strikes me, whatever. Do this. Ready, set, go. You've got 10 minutes. Show me what you got. Because you're going to be doing this. If you're going to be in this business, you're going to be doing this for the rest of your life. Remember the, the, uh, the saying, speed kills? Speed much to many people's chagrin, is very important in our business these days. We deliver information unbelievably fast, and it is frightening at times uh, what we do. And if you don't believe that, I'll give you an assignment for today. When you leave here, if you're not familiar with, Google a name. The name is Sunil Trapathy. <laughs> and you will get an idea of what I'm talking about, the kinds of decisions that I make every day and the kind of dangers that we're flirting with increasingly in the business. Um, Steve and Steve down there, um, hey, let's try to get through some, you know, we won't have everybody answer every question, but, uh, but, but go ahead quickly on some, some advice, career advice for students. Um, right off the bat, uh, get ready to never, well, not be able to celebrate a holiday. <laughs> Start and you're going to work every hour. You have to work your way out. That's your responsibility. That's your career. 
Uh, next question, we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving right along. Uh, this will be a uh, last question. We'll, we'll take a two minute break and let everybody uh, go to the bathroom or something and, and just take a second. Um, another uh, fan out there worked for John Bassoni at, uh, at Comcast, but, uh, and they ask, uh, from your point of view uh, as local media executives, um, how has uh, the new technology or whatever your medium changed your uh, business? Eugene, you're up. Uh, well, those of us who work in radio, a uh, combination of podcasts and live streaming has, is disrupting our business in a way that the newspaper business was disrupted. <laughs> uh, and that means we have to consider that where the audience is. How much is looking for stuff immediately now live streaming? How much is looking for things that are longer, more in-depth that they will listen to at their own schedule uh, you know, as a podcast? and figuring out, well, where do we want to spend our people's time? You know, we can't do everything equally well. We have to be, we have to be strategic with that. And I, you know, I feel like that's something we're kind of feeling our way through right now. I don't have a, 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 a real stable sense of, of how much we're going to devote in any one medium. I think it, it's, over the last two years, it's, it's changed quite a bit. Um, I think the main thing is changed. That's definitely part of it. Um, we're into so many things that we don't hire sort of uh, people anymore who only do one thing. Uh, so we don't hire somebody who's just a reporter. We don't hire somebody who's just a, an editor. We call it a producer. We don't hire just a producer. So you, you may be called upon. The more of skills in each of those areas you can bring to the table, the more valuable you will be. So that, to me, is actually the biggest change in terms of bringing people uh, on board. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I, I'm pretty positive about that. Part of it was because we internalized our traffic service, but still, I mean, we're up to like 80 some people now, which is crazy. Oh, nobody can incorporate it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. But the, uh, yeah, so I, I, I think that uh, if, you take it, if you take advantage of knowing uh, how to do some of that new stuff, if you become an expert in that, go to the right meetings, go to the right social gatherings or seminars about social media and all that stuff, I think you'd be much better. Uh, because we know a lot of us who are doing the hiring have no idea what Marianne, uh, you know you want to jump in on the technology question? For sure. This thing hurt and helped us every single day. It kills us because you can get everything on your phone. Why are you going to turn on your TV? You can wake up and just keep scrolling. A, a lot of you are doing it in here. I know I am. And it's right there. So now the challenge is, why do you have to come to us? We're on it for six hours in the morning. Six hours. <laughs> Every morning. And that's what we're up against. When people wake up in the morning, what do they do? They check their social media. <laughs> so then the question becomes, well, how do we get them back to the TV? And for weather especially, how many things do you have going off on your phone that tells you what the weather's going to be? You know. You don't have to watch TV anymore for that. That used to be the biggest thing. So now how do we make that work on TV? And it becomes about the personality then. Because if you can see it on your phone, we have to make sure that you're going to tune in to Sue Serio in the morning and Kathy or at night to get it. Because we're competing against social media. As far as news gathering, it, <laughs> it's crazy. It helps you in every way. You can communicate with people in Puerto Rico. This morning, we're talking to somebody on Twitter. Oh my gosh, are you safe? Yeah, do you want me to call in? It's just like that. It's instant. So those are some of the challenges we face and some of the ways it's helped us, too. And that leads us to somebody did have a social media question. And, um, you know, it's Facebook, it's Instagram, it's Twitter, uh, and, uh, and all other kinds of social media. But can you talk about it as news gatherers and, and as news executives, you know, the, the danger of having access to all that info and then, you know, I guess we could all speak about it as parents of, oh boy, and we, we, we take that huge gulp. Um, let's Somebody talked about it coming in. Yeah, Somebody no. said about, the, was it you, Phil? Yeah, it's a fair game. Mary, why don't, why don't you uh, touch upon it, that how, how your newsroom is, you know, that you're, you're on top of it. You're checking everybody's profiles, you're reading about it, and, and how that happens and works. 
the first question we all ask, do we have permission to use this? Yeah. Um, and everybody's looking for it. There are a million programs, and I know we're all pitched them every day, to gather social media, to gather those pictures. Um, you know, if there's a snowstorm, if there's a hurricane, whatever it is, if there's a fire, if there was a shooting, uh, you can see it right on your phone immediately. So then the question becomes, okay, whose picture is that? Did we ask their permission or do we need to? Can we make a fair use argument out of this? So yes, the, uh, it's available instantly, but then we have to decide, and it could be fake. A lot of those videos went around during hurricanes. Oh, look at this video. And it's fake. So did you ask the right questions? Um, it's a lot, because a lot is coming at you at one time. And as far as being a parent, <laughs> um, I'm a mom of two. And it is really hard, because you have, to, you have to watch yourself on there, just like you're watching your kids. They're, when we were kids, when we were kids, they, they didn't have this. We didn't have this. It, if somebody said something behind your back, you didn't care because you didn't find out about it most times. Now it's on your phone and it stays there. So it's so dangerous. And I mean, it, it's really, although we love our phones and we're all connected to these phones, there are some days when it's like, it's a blessing and a curse. It really is. Um, just a, a reminder, um, I think you guys all have microphones there. Can yeah. you just double check that uh, the uh, mic is on? And because uh, yeah. I think some of them weren't weren't on for the. You know, one for of the, the web things stream. about the. the but Phil, jump in. Uh, you know, talking about social media, I know you've uh, whole, you've jumped in feet first. The whole social media experience is obviously something that I troll in now 24 hours a day, but I like to look at it in a little bit larger scope and perspective. And what we used to refer to when we do this every day is we used to consider this publishing a newspaper. The truth of the matter is today every person with one of these is a publisher. They all have information out there. They're all flooding it out there. There is a little bit of difference with this and with anything that you see of mine in that if you go on my Twitter, my Facebook, in the paper, you will not see anything connected with me that does not have my name directly beside it, that is attached to that tweet, that Facebook post, or whatever. So much of what is out there is just out there, and it's being put out there. And I think you know, one of the things that we're realizing now as we look back over the last few years is you know, how much of that information is accurate. Accuracy is something that, as I said before, speed kills. I will be the first to admit. Uh, one of the things that I do uh, very early each morning is update and add to and start pushing information both to our website and on social media. And there is nothing more frustrating to me than having, you know, glance at the uh, website and see that you've just made a glaring typo in the lead headline on your website. And why is that? Because I can tell you it's a little bit like being the Walenda family. If you know what the Walenda family is famous for, you know, most mornings, the truth of the matter is, there's me and maybe one other person at the paper who is literally working without a net. You know, a lot of stuff that I publish every day doesn't get looked at by anyone else. And that is, I'll be the first to admit, a very dangerous practice. But it is the world that we live in. As I said before, speed now is important, much more important than it used to be. And Phil, I give you permission to stop uh, posting stuff at 6 a.m. You, <laughs> you can sleep in a little bit. Um, but Steve, um, just touch upon, because you, you've worked in the trenches, and you know, it, it's, it's a valuable resource, and, and it's such a curse. Too. Well, it is a valuable resource, um, because you get it right away. Everybody thinks, just like Phil said, everybody's a social media reporter right now. But the problem is, those people who are putting the video online and putting the information online, is the information confirmed? There's a code of conduct that we all follow. And we will not put information on television online or anywhere else. That is not confirmed. 
we need that confirmed. I'll call Dave Splain in the middle of the night, the gentleman with the <laughs> uniform right there. <laughs> and, it, you know, it, and we have to get that confirmed. The video that you're putting online, that people are putting online, that's dangerous too. If that, if that video is showing undercover police officers, those police officers are now made, they're out there. And everybody who watches that video or sees that picture, those officers are now in danger. We will not put on bodies and stuff like that, but it's out there. So we can edit those videos, but the people who are putting those videos on there, there's a lot of danger behind it. I have we, a different angle real quick on Yeah, this. Steve. One no thing that bugs me a, a lot about social media is its uh, sort of uh, adoption by public agencies and companies that believe that putting out a statement via social media is, is proper and, and your, my job is done now. And the opposite couldn't be more true. Uh, and we're actually, our, our station is starting to call people out on that a little bit. Like, if all you're going to do is put a statement out on Twitter, we're going to say so-and-so wasn't available for an interview. Yeah, because that's really, it. yeah, because it, it, that's, that's, I don't like that crutch about social media, which is becoming very widespread now. And um, that doesn't really work for us. We've, we've can, talked about, um, Mike, can I say one more thing? Sure, go ahead. I've, I've become a little bit of an evangelist for the idea that don't share anything on social unless you've read it. But if think about it, how many times in your daily use on, on Facebook or Twitter you see something with the headline you like, you have no idea what the source is. And you, and you probably just kind of shared it because it, it's something that you agree with in terms of the sentiment. Fr of friends and colleagues of mine have, have often fallen into the trap of sharing something that they see as pos of, you know, something they agree with. But if they had actually read the underlying article, <laughs> they would have been embarrassed to have shared it. And I think Part of one of the things that, that everyone as a, a, a citizen on social media is that it would become somewhat more reliable if there were people who weren't passing on stuff unknowingly. Because, you know, how, do, how does fake news flourish? Mm -hmm. Lots of people sharing stuff because, oh, it expresses the sentiment that I believe in, even though I have no idea what this website is, I have no idea whether the people are, you know, up to no good or just trying to make a buck or whatever. One other crucial piece of advice for students, because it's something that I am now dealing with <laughs> several times a week. Uh, this thing is, although we like to think of it, is, is, it, is not, it is not eternal. Uh, it doesn't stay around forever. It stays maybe on the coffee table for a couple of days or whatever. In your actions and your behaviors, should you merit something that gets you into this? there's a good chance that that is also going to wind up on DelcoTimes.com. I have news for you. That is, in fact, forever. It never goes away. I get calls every week now from kids who are getting ready. Actually, most of the time I get it from the moms. I don't know why. But the mom always calls three years later son or daughter is getting ready to go out into the work world and lo and behold when a prospective employer googles their name the first thing that pops up is the hazing ritual that they were charged in when they were freshmen in college that stuff does not go away so tread carefully out there let's uh, move on to um, you know obviously uh, breaking news is uh, is king in local news um, We've had several questions from the audience about uh, nonprofits trying to fight through the media clutter. Um, what's the best advice you could uh, give those folks to try to get their story told uh, uh, in an appropriate manner in, in your particular medium? I think it also Angela, happens. let's start with you. Uh, um, you know, it, it, it's tough for TV, but, but there's a balance of trying to get, get to those good stories. Absolutely. Uh, I, I do. I have three points uh, on this. One, uh, topical. Uh, you know, topical. Like, what's in the news already, and how can your organization uh, be an expert? You know, at it or have uh, some type of connection to it. So that means that you know, topical means it's something that's already. It's you know, hey, you know, we got hurricanes today and earthquakes, and and if you're representing you know, an organization that is providing help, relief, or what have you, 
today is your day. You know, today is your day to pick up the phone and call the television station, send an, an email. So, you know, your best, you know, your, 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 your number one way to get to us is sometimes, you know, we may not be thinking about you, but you have something. That's when you can kind of put it out there. And then uh, my second point on that is, uh, you know, you have to spoon feed. You know, you spoon feed us, we'll eat. <laughs> you know, we'll eat. Don't make it tough on us. Don't make it hard on us. Um, you know, you know, be flexible. Hey, I can meet you here. I have, uh, you know, hey, what time do you, where you want us at? You know, make sure your cell phone numbers is there, everything that we need to contact you, that we can get a hold of you. Because when we, by the time we call you, we needed it yesterday. You know, that's, oh yeah, give me a couple of hours that I can, no, 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 we don't have a couple of hours. We're moving on to the next person who is ready. So I will say to you is if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Stay ready and be ready to, to, to pitch your organization you know, in, a, in a heartbeat. You may wake up in the morning and something is going on, and you need to send an email and have those contacts and those phone numbers already ready. And the last thing for me is uh, what I call characters. You know, by the time you know, we are talking to your organization, we give us a client. Give us a patient, a victim, yep. a success story, someone that was impacted by us. Give us somebody to uh, put a face to it because without faces and characters, we don't have stories. That is the essential you know, element of a story is, is a character. And that's how people remember the stories. That's how they're gonna remember your organization is through those, is through those characters. And, and if you don't believe me, we were taught things through characters. Jack and Jill went up the hill. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. We know that because they put a character to it. So we're still practicing those things in, in journalism. So if you have a nonprofit organization or uh, any type of organization where you're trying to get us in to do a story, it may not happen when you want it to happen, but uh, you be paying attention to what else is going on in the news. Marianne. I also think you have to stand out from the crowd when you're doing your pitch. I mean, here we go back to the phones again, but your email just gets so flooded. Everybody's emailing. And so if you don't know the person's name, it's like, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. So either make a connection with someone or stand out from the crowd. We had somebody who was pitching. Um, they wanted us to go to a concert a couple years ago. Cover the concert, cover the concert. We, we, we need to come on Good Day Philadelphia. And we were like, there's just not, because it is all about time. Even though it's a six hour show, it's kind of like, okay, only the strong survive here, so who's getting in? But here, the press release came to the newsroom. Now imagine that, something did not get emailed. Something physically came to the newsroom and it had, um, red M&Ms attached to it. There's a bag of red M&Ms. I'm not talking about the food part, but I am talking about the fact that something was weighing the press release down. And it wasn't even a press release. It just said, come to the concert. But the red M&Ms, they were on a rider that the person who the concert was for, that was on the rider. The, per the celebrity had to have red M&Ms in their dressing room before they held the concert. Guess who paid attention to the press release? We all started talking about it. What are the, what is the red m and what? Somebody sent M&Ms to the newsroom? No, what, why are they only red? Okay, sure enough, Mike picked it up and he was talking about it on the air the next day. So you really do have to stand out from the crowd. It just can't be, and the worst, the worst is when you get the email and then five minutes later, because you're not busy, nobody's busy, you get five minutes later, oh, did you have a chance to read this yet? No, we're in the middle of Maria coverage. Okay, and then 20 minutes later, did you get, no. So I do think that you have to stand out from the crowd, respect people's time, and I t wholeheartedly agree with what you said about taking advantage of what's going on in the news. Things need to be timely. You know, pitch the people part of it, not the product part of it. Steve McKenzie. Oh, um, well, just like Marianne said, we are flooded with emails constantly. So if you are going to pitch something, it, your press release has to pretty much say it to me in your headline. 
I need to know what it is in your headline because I do not have time to read three paragraphs and figure out what the heck is going on. In 30 seconds or less, right? I mean, you Without got a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Spoon feed. Do, and when you do, do uh, follow up with the call. Don't do it 10 minutes before air or when we're on the air. That is just like right there. That's a red flag. And it, but always keep your cell phone on there. And know the difference between the organizations. Too. Yes. You know, it's. Uh, they're, yeah, they're, know what you're pitching. Yeah, sure. you know what you're pitching. You know, there's clear differences between, you know, all of, all of us up here. And, uh, and you know, and don't um, try to copy and paste. Sometimes, like, you know, people do it. They yep. send me resumes. They have some other news director's name at the top of it <laughs> or whatever. But, like, uh, you know, I've always, you know, I've always wanted to, you know, Mark Fox you. to come and, you know, and cover this. Well, yeah, you just emailed NBC, you know. And, and so, that happens. You laugh, that happens. I got one for the Today Show. I'm like, how does that happen? Did you not? My email is at foxtv.com. That's, that's when you just go, Shh, that one's out. I get some that say Anzio. Just get your email. <laughs> <laughs> People I send say, it to hey, the wrong TV. <laughs> Steve, sorry about that. I sent that last week. Quick question um, with, with, you know, the, the, uh, the financials of, of the media industry. Is there any, you know, better day to have a press conference or do events that make it easier for you guys to cover if yes. you're a nonprofit or a, um, you know, uh, a public agency that's... that's Bad really news, you do it 4.45 Friday afternoon. Well, we... <laughs> <laughs> um, can you kind of give some insight to some of the folks out there of, hey, look, here's... Here's kind of windows to, to work with it. Yeah, I mean, this is, I always tell uh, folks who uh, are involved with nonprofits, your boss is probably your worst enemy because your boss wants to have this nice little event at the end of the day, maybe have like a little cocktail hour, a little reception, at like five or six o'clock. Well, there's four TV stations doing news there. So, you know, your chances of you getting covered are probably not very strong. So that's really a really bad time to do it. Uh, Mondays and Fridays aren't really necessarily great because, you know, some staffers work over the weekend, which means you're not as, as staffed as heavily on a Friday or Monday. Is that the case in your shop? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, right. So same here. So that's not, those aren't great days. Uh, and I guess kind of middays are good. But here's the thing. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I think nonprofits we've dealt with where they're not necessarily offering uh, coverage of an event, but offering the availability of somebody that might, you know, whenever you can set it up on your schedule, is usually a lot more valuable to us. And then it's also a lot more, you know, it's, rather than having like a thing where everybody's there, if you, you know, want to be able to interview somebody, um, that, that's a lot more valuable to us than, you know, schlepping to an event where everybody in town's gonna be there. Um, and just my own personal uh, thing, uh, I tell my reporters never to RSVP for an event. Unless you're serving a hot lunch, I'm not gonna RSVP to you. <laughs> I get, I'm tired of the RSVP. That's the other thing I'm tired of. I told you I was crotchet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Eugene. A couple things. One is don't waste your time having people call to check whether you got the press release unless the person knows what right. it's about. Right. I feel bad for these what sound like interns, interns. who call <laughs> to check, did you get our press release? And then if you ask them a question, they know nothing about it. Uh, it, it <laughs> there are better things you could have your interns doing. Uh, the other thing is that sometimes organizations, the head honcho is the worst enemy because the head honcho doesn't really know all the details, but they want to be the face. Mm -hmm. And for a good news story, you want to get down to the person who really knows what's going on. And it might be that more entry-level person in your organization who's dealing directly with people mm -hmm. who can really tell you those interesting, compelling details. But if the, the verdict from on high is that the, you know, the president or CEO has to be the person talking. That ruins it. It ruins it because that does they, ruin it. they only know generalities. And, you know, there can be a, a space for maybe, you know, one quick comment from the yep. head honcho in the story, but the more compelling stories are the people who are on the ground level. One other piece of advice that people in public organizations often also don't think of, and that is uh, we are an equal opportunity publicist and that sword swings both ways. Uh, I've always said there are two people who call the newspaper, aside from the people who want to complain about the headline on the front page and the fact that uh, we didn't run the TV page correctly. But they are, one, people who desperately, like probably a lot of you, looking to get something into the newspaper, and two, 
people who are just as desperately hoping and praying to get something and make sure that it does not get into the newspaper. And my way of bringing that up is to remind you that, yes, we enjoy uh, being able to cover a lot of your events, and we appreciate the cooperation. But as I said, we are an equal opportunity publicist. I can pretty much guarantee you you are a business here in the county, if you're a school district here in the county, if you have a nonprofit here in the county, there's a fairly good chance that we may be calling you someday under maybe not the best of circumstances. When we get a no comment and a click on that phone, we have a tendency to remember that the next time someone calls and say, hey, can you come out and cover our event? Yeah, it has to be. Um you know, know what role you're playing, especially for organizations where you are the public information officer, and then you turn around and you're the PR person too, and and that's that's when it gets that's when it gets tricky, and and uh, and I love it, especially like malls. You know, the malls are always the one that you know I hear from, and they have PR people that call and they want you to come out on these holidays and on these times when they're Black Friday. having the Black Friday, and they got the Easter money and all this other stuff, and then as soon as something happens in the mall, and then they, there's no comment, and don't come on our property. You can't come in here. And, and what they don't realize is, is that a yeah, big place everybody in with a Prussia? cell phone right. is, is on your property, and, and they're like, well, we told you guys not to come. I said, I understand that, you know? And so they just don't realize that when you're doing both, uh, you, know, you know, be honest with people, be straightforward, folks. And, and, uh, and then I'm a big believer, too, in... Um, in establishing relationships on the front end. Uh, you know, if you've never been to a television station, never been to a newspaper, you ever just, you know, just, I mean, you don't know what they're doing on the inside. It, it is a, um, it, it, it is somewhat of a, of a struggle. Usually by the time you're having a conversation with me, something has gone wrong. <laughs> you don't know, <laughs> and something has gone wrong, and, 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 and I'm like, oh, it's a shame. This is our first time, you know, having a conversation. Uh, and then I would say too, and even in those conversations, um, sometimes when it's, we put something on TV that you don't like, I'm a big believer in um, having difficult conversations while preserving a relationship. And, and, that, and I give my reporters uh, that, that same deal. You know, we, you know we're, not in the, we're not in the ambush business, we're not in the surprise business. You know, we would prefer that your people are prepared. We prefer that they're prepared, but if you keep telling us, no, uh, no, we're not going to put them, no, we're not going to do this. At some point, then I'm going to say, I'm going to take the leash off. At some point, I'll take the leash off, and i said, okay, go get them. And just depending upon their public information officer or what have you, we'll, we'll come get you. You know, I tell people, I got a helicopter, you can't hide. <laughs> uh, a lot of folks, a lot of the nonprofits and other organizations um, have events on the weekends. And... You know, like every business, it's, it's limited resources on the weekends for TV stations, the radio stations, the newspaper. How, what's your policy on uh, accepting maybe video from an event or some still photos from an event? Or I'm not sure how you could do it with radio, but maybe a phone interview or something. But, but what, what, what do you advise people to do on, on those types of situations? One of the things that uh, is applicable certainly to us that works in your favor is just that. Look, I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you. We don't have the staff that we once had. Uh, if you can supply us with a photo and the information that we need from your event, bring it on. Uh, very likely to, to run in our uh, community news pages. Uh, I would love to be able to send someone out to those events, uh, especially on the weekend, but the truth is I'm probably not going to be able to. If you can supply us with that information, I guess we call that what user-generated content is now <laughs> the, uh, the buzzword. But uh, yeah, we use a lot of Steve I, or uh, Eugene. Uh, you know, radio is a little bit different. Well, yeah. I, for me, uh, one thing I always tell uh, nonprofits, especially, is that um, generally speaking, I think you want if you're having an event that's for a community-based kind of thing, you want people to be there. So it's probably we're better we're better in the preview business uh, where we can tell people about something that's going to happen this weekend, and you know here you know you can enjoy this or enjoy you know that we're better in that world than actually you know showing up doing the event which doesn't isn't going to mean much to anybody after it's over oh gee I couldn't go to that you know 
So that's a better way to, I think, get on KYW at least. I uh, can't speak for everybody. But we don't take um, interviews uh, that were not done by us, but we can do them on the phone. We don't like doing them on the phone, but we can. Although sometimes we have you dictate it into your iPhone and send it to, send it to us. We do that a lot. Um, I mean, we'll interview you, but you're recording yourself on your iPhone. Uh, we do that a lot. And um, what else? Uh, well, yeah, I guess that's it. Eugene, oh, you want to yeah, touch we on really, uh, we, we could, yeah, we would it, take pictures for social. It's tough. In, in the weekends, uh, you know, to their defense, you know, with the limited resources, it's the one, two, or three big stories of the weekend that are going to glom up most of the coverage. And, uh, and our time so is, is tighter. In, in time know, Yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't have as, as and, much. And there's food. fractured audiences on the weekend. Uh, just, you know, you know it's, it's college football, and the newscast isn't always on it. At, at five. So that's the difficulty you face out there. We've got a lot of time to fill, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 24. But I, I would second everything he said that, you know, with weekend events, it's more often a preview type thing. We would take, if you had a great photo from the last time you did that event, that, mm -hmm. that shows that we would use that for the website. And we also use people's, have people record themselves on their phones and email us the file that sounds a lot better than just recording over the phone. The trick is, though, you need two phones, either two cell phones or a landline and a cell phone. <laughs> uh, in the recent campaign, we heard a lot about uh, fake news. Um, how has that, uh, I guess, uh, affected you and impacted your local news organizations? It hasn't one bit, to be honest with you. I, it, it hasn't affected my job one bit. I still do the same thing. I get everything confirmed. And I make sure that everything that is on the air has been confirmed and it's 100% or else it will not go on the air. You know, for me, it just proves the, um, you know, every day that we wake up, we have to prove ourselves. We have to be accurate. We have to be correct. We have to be fair. And, um, and you know, when we're called the, the enemy of the, of the people or the state or whatever uh, was said, you know, and I'm sitting here right now texting with one of my reporters in Puerto Rico you know, and, um, and, and worried about him and the photographer, and uh, that doesn't sound like the enemy of uh, the people to me. Uh, you know, no, we are we're, we're just as much the first line of, of, uh, of defense and of information as, as anyone. You know, I, I uh, told you I, I lived and worked through Katrina, and, um, and I truly believe that people around the country didn't know that the flooding was as bad mm -hmm. until we got, we put pictures. We had to go out and get it. And I was sitting in the city and I didn't know how bad it was. And, and finally I had to, you know, tell somebody, all right, yeah, you know what, go and it's four of you going together. Be careful, get that video and come right back. And I'm looking at this video, it's like, oh wow, okay, we gotta get this out. We gotta make sure the networks and everybody else sees it, the country sees it. So, you know, um, I, I think that we have to be, as journalists, um, you know, true to the principles of the profession. And our principles of our profession, uh, I believe, will withstand the test of time, news stories, peoples, people, uh, and presidents. But here's where we're guilty. Um, and I've, I've been complaining about this for years, and nobody's, you know, nobody's gonna listen to me, but the, uh, um, you know, all websites, almost all websites, run those crazy stories that, you know, they want you to click on, you know, uh, uh, pictures of TV stars from the 70s you're not going to believe. I mean, uh, news websites have those on their sites. And that's where a lot of the fake news lives, is in those sections of websites. And we accept those, uh, those who are in the digital space, because there's money. We get paid, you know, by the click. Uh, and because digital media doesn't make enough money, uh, that's going to be something I guess that's going to persist. So I, I feel like we're not completely innocent in that realm. I, I think we're 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 part of the problem in that in that area. That's something that I I just hope that the industry thinks about a little bit more than it does right now. Eugene, I think fake news has different meanings. Some people just ascribe fake news to anything that they disagree with. And that makes it harder to do journalism yeah. if you have a section of your audience who Especially feels now. that way. So that, I would say it does affect us in that regard because it's become this thing that, like, if, you know, I think most people can agree with stuff that's made up from whole cloth and posted as if it were true that, you know, is truly fake and we can all agree on that. But you know, people's opinions about 
something that's happening can be very different. And if, and if our reflex is, well, I don't agree with it, so that's fake news, it, may, it certainly makes it more challenging. You know, it makes it more challenging for us, our people, our reporters, to get people to agree to talk to us. <laughs> because then, you know, the, the, I, I, find that, I find that there's somewhat more resistance in that, in that realm. People are a little less likely to want to talk to to reporters and have, have their quotes be put online or put on the air. Um, the making of the sausage and, and the making of local news is, it, it's a messy, messy business. Uh, unbelievably competitive, uh, unbelievably demanding, a um, lot of critical decisions made each and every day by you guys. Um, what, what's the best time though for folks out there in the community, either nonprofits or, or other organizations, to reach out to you to get a fair and valuable assessment of whether they got a great story or they got a bust. Steve? Real quick, just so, it, excuse me, if you do have a weekend event in television, I don't uh, know the way it is actually in radio, but we have weekend planners. Somebody's planning the weekend events, and that's usually on Thursdays. So you would need to know who the, you, it's usually the morning assignment editor on Saturday and Sundays, they usually plan for the weekend events. So you need to get in with that person. Because that person will put the event on the day sheet for that day. Is it the same with you, Mary? Mm -hmm. a, Anzio, is it the same thing on Thursdays? So uh, that's the best time to get a hold of if you're gonna do something on the weekend. The other thing is, if you're having a benefit, the, usually we'll, we'll cover the benefit, but the follow-up call is always great of how much money you raised, how much food you raised. If you're doing stuff like that, we, we really want to highlight exactly what that benefit did, you know, and it, our viewers want to see that as well. And it's sort of the people who, you know, donate. They want to see collectively how well they did. That's also a reason to run the story. Yeah, without a doubt. As it relates to uh, when to call, I always say the errors earlier and later. You know, usually somewhere that between that 7 and 8 a.m., you might get everybody before it. The craziness of the day starts. And then usually we kind of, you know, sometimes after 7.30, but before, you know, they get too crazy for the, for the late news, uh, is a time you might get somebody, you know, on, on the phone. But any time in between that, certainly when newscasts are on air, and, and uh, that, 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 the newscast on air is, is certainly the, the, the worst you know, the absolutely worst time, or probably the worst is maybe 10, 15 minutes before yeah. a newscast is on the air because everybody's going crazy and we're running out of time. And just and know the news too, I think is important that if you want us to invest in, in, your, in your product or your organization, you need to invest in ours. I mean, you should not call when we're in wall-to-wall -wall snow coverage. I mean, we've had that. Are you coming to our event? Well, have you seen the last two hours that we've been doing? Because we're not doing anything but snow. So I think you just have to know the news of the day, too, uh, before you make those phone calls and before you send those pitches. Invest in your resource. If you're about to call us or email us, know what's going on. Know the people, know their names. Know, know our anchors and reporters, too. I mean, that just shows that you're invested. And if you're asking us, to give you airtime and invest in you, then you should really do the same. Yeah, especially yep. the reporters too, because you know, when we have that morning meeting, uh, they're, they're in there pitching your idea uh, you know, in the room. Uh, so if you actually can target, okay, this is a person I hear on the radio reporting these kinds of stories mm -hmm. or on TV you know, showing me this, uh, that person is likely to respond to an email from you because they don't get 500 like I do. So, you know, they, they will probably be your best advocate in the room. Now, if there's two of them pitching the same story, then I know you're really doing your job. But, yeah. Now, if your organization is giving away snowblowers, <laughs> you know, doing that snowstorm, <laughs> you know, or your business has shovels or whatever, call. You, call, call us. And then, you, you, hey, we got some. Yes. And I guess the other pet peeve is, uh, you know, from working at the desk at six for 20 years is don't start the conversation with, you guys never cover any good news. <laughs> that goes over really well. Right away, it's, you know, all these stations and, and the radio. We don't. Yeah. Um, but, but, I mean, all of you have gotten those calls. And, um, and right away, you're just put off by, by, by that person. 
and, and everybody tries to balance out their newscast. And, and maybe you could touch upon that of, of you're in that newsroom every day, and Phil, you're, you, you see a lot of doom and gloom, and you're always trying to think, well, what's that bright, shining moment we're going to be able to get in the two and a half hours of news or six hours of news we're doing today to try to balance some of the, the murder and the mayhem and the craziness of, a, of the fourth largest TV market? If you have an animal, include the animal. People love, people, <laughs> man, people love animals. Layla and Gracie, wow, they were hits. Uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted a little bit to, to hit on is this idea of everyone is talking about what we have and, and what we're doing. And I would issue a warning for everyone here at this table and for everyone out there as to what we are not doing or no longer doing and the danger that lies therein. The truth of the matter is we are not covering communities the way we once did. And the fact that we are not there and that there is not that light being shown upon those procedures is a very, very dangerous animal out there. Uh, there are things that happen when there is no one there to see it and report it that maybe would not. So I would tell you to value, take stock in your, in your local media. Uh, it is very important. I was absolutely stunned at the, the amount of time and effort that we have put into covering what I happen to consider the most important economic story in the region. Well, maybe number two, Nick until we figure out where the hell Amazon wants to go, is uh, this, this pipeline story here in the county. And I was flabbergasted to see some comments from people at a local township meeting saying, where did this come from? When did this happen? That are completely aloof and out of that, that loop. As much information that is out there you know, I don't know what they were, maybe they were watching the Kardashians, but they weren't aware Probably. that this thing was going to show up and dig up their backyard. It's a very dangerous, slippery slope to go down. Anybody else? Steve Butler? Um, I think one of the, one of the da additional dangers of what was just said is that um, these, were, these uh, county, uh, 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 township boards and even courtrooms uh, that you know don't get a lot of attention from reporters slip into this world where they think that at some point they don't even have to let us in, yeah. uh, and that's something that is uh, I, I find more and more. Like a reporter will tell me, "Well, they wouldn't let me in." So what do you mean they wouldn't let me in? Of course they have to let you in. Lay down the lay down you know, on, the, on the threshold. They gotta let you in. Uh, well, they're gonna arrest me. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'll send somebody else out. <laughs> but it's like. Uh, you know, that, that bothers me because I think, and again, that's because we have not been as aggressive of being there, and I think it's allowed people to, uh, to and again, I don't think they're being uh, mean about it. I think it's just that they don't understand that the media is supposed to be at these things. I think it's part of the problem. Anybody else want to touch that? Um, as you guys continue to do uh, more and more with less resources, um, is there... Um, what particular days, though? I mean, do you, you know, let's frame that again for, for folks. Like, is it, is it Tuesday through Thursday the best day? Is it, uh, you know, a Monday when it's, hey, we're coming off the weekend and it's still soft? What, what, what are you guys uh, advising folks out there? For a day to pitch stories? For, yeah, daily. It definitely, I mean, we're in the news business. It depends on, I know I keep saying this, but it is important that it depends on what the news is. But I think typically Mondays. I mean, you're just going into the week. Um, if you had to pick a day. I, it sounds so funny for me to say that, though, because it really does depend on what else is going on. Yeah. Um, besides the day, there's always this standard time that everybody thinks that we should have events. It's either 10 AM, 11 AM, or you know, 1. Um, Yes, there's uh, um, a lack of resources here and there, but the, the technology of television has grown to the fact that we don't need a live truck to put up a, what, 30-foot mask these days? We have these little boxes called Degeros that feed back video instantaneously through cell phone signals. 
So having a three, two o'clock event, having a three o'clock event, we'll make it on the air for five and six o'clock. It does not have to be the 10 a.m., 11 a.m. slot anymore. It's actually, the day's open. And since the day is still so crowded at 10 and 11 in the morning, the chance of something happening at 1, 2, and 3, making it on the air, is a lot greater than something happening at 10 or 11. Because there's so many people doing the 10 and 11. So stand out from that 10 and 11. Do something in the afternoon. What? I mostly agree, sort of. Well, you don't have to share it. It's your radio. No, we have this. We have to share Well, in radio, I mean, we're, we've, got, we've got newscasts all the time. Yeah, all the time. Right. So, you know, it, it's less of a, you know, strategic window within a day. Uh, I find the one day that I just don't have bandwidth to pitch things that aren't on fire, field pitches that are not on fire immediately is Friday. Uh, Friday, there's a lot of work that we do in terms of prepping things for a weekend and the following Monday in terms of things that we can lay in in advance and, vers and ver it to add to the things that we are, we're putting together during the weekend. So Fridays are particularly busy in my shop. Well, we really have to know in, in television whether you're expecting a package with a reporter or a VO, which is just a 30 second, 25, 30 second, you know, you on the event on the air, um, a VO with sound, you know, somebody from your event speaking as well. We don't send reporters to everything. We have photographers that are going very capable of getting the best shots there, and they feed it back right away. And that's why it's so easy to get on in the afternoon. I think for, for us, um, our, our folks are doing 500 things all at the same time. They're trying to get from one event to the next. So uh, if you can make parking easy for us. Uh, again, I'm, I'm into spoon feeding. You know, yeah. they make parking uh, easy for us. Two, tell us your most visual uh, time period. You got a three hour event, help us out here. Hey, you say, you know what, if you're here in this, you know, between 12 and 12, 20, we're gonna have balloons and elephants walking backwards or something, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> it, whatever it is. But if you can just kind of tell us right in there that lets us, you know, know that, and, and we're gonna save a parking space for you so you can get in and, and get out and here is, the cell phone number to the person yeah. on site. Here's the cell phone number to the person on site. Uh, and then after the event, after we leave, go ahead and send a quick, here's how the event went, here's all the people that showed up. I mean, have that ready because normally that photographer that came without a reporter is going to go drop the video off or just feed it back in live and he's going to the next thing. And some producer who is not at the event is now going to write the story to represent you. So you got to have some information, you know, already back in their hands, not what you sent out on the beginning about what the event was going to be like. You just could kind of reinforce it on the back so that you can make sure whatever information that you're trying to, to get on TV that that producer or the anchor, whoever it is is writing, can uh, write it with, with some facts. And, and since we're in the uh, center of the universe in Delaware County, uh, I want to have Phil uh, ring in on that and just, you know, let, let folks know What's the best way to reach out to you folks over at the, the Delco Times? I mean, you know, as much as I hate it, email's the best way to, to, to get something in. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things I was going to add, and then I thought maybe, oh, no, I shouldn't, but maybe I probably should, because it does, in fact, still happen every once in a while. Phone call, wow, great story idea. Yeah, that sounds like something we'd really like to do. When is it? 15 minutes from now. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't do that. Uh, give us a, a week or whatever. Uh, preview is, is an idea that we like to do, uh, in part for, for us, but also in part for you. If you're looking for, to have an event where you are hoping to get the public to take part in, well, get us the information a week or two weeks ahead of time so that we can get something in to let people know that we run it the day of, you're not gonna get the, the traffic that you're, that you're gonna get. But uh, by all means, email us. And read the newspaper. Read it and see how we write those kinds of events. And when you're giving us something, mimic what you see in the newspaper. Know, hey, you know what? When that, uh, when that guy's title is before his name, they capitalize it. And when the title is used after his name, they don't capitalize it. Those are little things that make it easier for us 
to move that information into the paper. And uh, while I'm uh, cursing, as I usually do, the technology gods, I still will, every once in a while, get down on my knees and say, wow, copy and paste. Whoever thought of that? What a great idea. <laughs> Um, I just have one final question for, for everybody. So, so get your pens and, and pencils ready because uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists and, and we thank you guys for, and Marianne, thank you for coming out and, and pulling back the curtain a little bit about your organizations. But uh, I guess leave everybody with a final thought and, and maybe a, a phone number. So not all your doors. So let's start with... Uh, uh, really, address uh, where everything uh, funnels in, regardless of where it's going into the newspaper. I usually like to see things, and then I can push them off, and uh, depending on what person should uh, best get that. Uh, you can reach me on uh, Twitter and Facebook. You can even read my blog, The Heron's Nest, which I get a chance to write every day. Please do that. But uh, go ahead and email us. Please utilize us. And as, as I said, our struggles right now are in a way working in your favor. If you can give us content, we'll be more than happy to use it. Uh, for, for NBC uh, 10 and Telemundo 62, you can email WCAUDesk, W-C-A-U-D-E-S-K, at NBCUNI.com. And that'll go to about 60 people in the newsroom 24-7. Uh, anybody can look at it and read it. I would say for final thoughts for me to students, it's just that hard work does pay off, but you really got to get in there and work your tail off. Uh, as far as PR agencies, like I said before, pitch the people, pitch the personal story, not just the product, um, and invest in our product if you want us to invest in yours. As far as um, my email, it's uh, Marianne, M-A-R-Y-A-N-N, dot Vaughn, V is in victory, A-U-G-H-N as in Nancy, at foxtv.com. For students, the one thing I would say, whether it's an internship or your first job, just make sure it's someplace where you're going to get to do real journalism. Don't go to a place with a big name where you're going to be stuck making copies and fetching coffee. If you could work at a smaller outlet and really get to write and report daily. Uh, my first job out of college was in upstate New York on, in a little place called Oswego, shore on Lake Ontario. I often refer to that as, I never went to graduate school. I refer to that, those three years as my graduate school because I did everything. <laughs> Everything from reporting, I would anchor, I would fill in for the news director when he was on vacation, I would, because it's public radio, I would do on-air pledge drives. Doing that, got, and being surrounded by people who were helping me get better, helped me become a better journalist far more than if I was stuck in some sort of entry-level position where it was much more clerical and not sort of journalism. And that goes also for, for, for internships. You know, before you accept an internship, talk to somebody, if you can, who's done it at that place and find out what you're really going to be doing to make sure that, because you may be, again, weighing a place with a bigger name versus a place with a smaller name, but you may be better off at the place with a smaller name if you're getting to do more. As for pitching me, I think what, what you, Marianne has said a lot in terms of proving that you understand who you're pitching to is, get, goes a long way familiarizing yourself with which programs carry which kind of things. Where we are, if it's an international thing, you're more likely to pitch like our call-in program, Radio Times, than you are the newsroom because the, we have NPR's international coverage <laughs> that on the air for the actual news on that kind of thing. Um, and finally, for where to send it, my email is pretty simple. It's E-S-O-N-N, -N, so E as in Edward, S as in Sam, O as in Oscar, two N's as in Nancy at whyy.org, not com, dot org, um, or newsroom at whyy.org also works. Um, for the students, um, you know, be curious. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I'm disappointed interviewing people who just don't seem curious about the news or anything. And it doesn't necessarily, uh, and be passionate also, and the passion may be attached to something that has nothing to do with news. If you're fairly uh, young and you're just uh, looking for an entry-level job with us, like obviously you don't have a resume that I'm really going to care about. 
you know, you, I, you know, if you intern somewhere, great, congratulations. But if you had a passion, if you worked on a project, uh, somebody we hired recently who worked on the uh, reentry project, which is a thing in Philadelphia, uh, you know, and that got my attention. Like, uh, this is somebody who has, you know, some thoughts about the, the world and uh, that she lives in, uh, and that, that really played well with me. So th that's good stuff. So you need to, if you can demonstrate that, I think that's always great. Um, also, and I apologize to the uh, to the uh, school officials who are in the room. Don't take your college education too seriously. Um, I'm not sure anybody on this panel has ever, ever asked for somebody's transcript. Would that be a fair? Answer? I don't think it's ever happened, right? So you know, I mean, enjoy your college, learn a lot. It's great, but you know, while you're here, you know, work on what you're going to do for that first job. And if you're taking up too much time in the production studio down the hall, or is it over there? It's over there. Um, or the school newspaper or something like that, great. That's much, to me, much better time spent than maybe not turning a paper in on time. That's just, that's just me. Um, unless your scholarship depends on it, I get that. <laughs> um, what was it? Oh, uh, KYW. If you want to reach KYW, uh, all the whole staff will see it if it goes to this address, which is um, uh, news tips at, no, I apologize for this, at KYW 1060 info.com. That way the whole newsroom will see it. Um, to reach our assignment desk, planning, myself, the managers, it is news desk at CBS3, the number three, dot com. Um, for everybody working in nonprofit, um, congrats. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, always get a hold of us because you do have great stories and we would love to tell them. For the students, remember, don't be afraid. Everyone you meet is a resource. So treat people with respect. We'd like to thank uh, Phil and Anzio and Marianne and Eugene and Steve and Steve. Uh, uh, great insight. We appreciate all your guidance and uh, we wish you guys uh, all the very best, and, and thanks for being a great audience and great, great questions. Hey, folks. Um, <coughs> thanks for coming back in, um, and thanks for, for staying around for uh, this media training we're going to do for you. It's going to be uh, media training on steroids. You know, we're going to kind of blow through a bunch of slides. Uh, I mean, we had no better media training than, you know, talking to uh, all of the local news outlets in the, uh, in the Delaware Valley. So uh, that's great. A little bit about myself. My name is Mike Nealon. Um, my bio is in there. Uh, don't believe everything in the bio. Uh, but I was behind the scenes for 20 years at Action News. Um, so I've covered my fair share of uh, doom and gloom. And, uh, and then I've also covered some incredible stories with some nonprofits and, and just regular people. And, and that's what we try to do. We try to tell stories about regular people and uh, because that's what resonates with with viewers and uh, you know it's easy to get caught up in the doom and the gloom and the stuff that leads the newscast but uh, I look at the newscast after the first 10 minutes sometimes you can see some incredible uh, incredible stories out there um, but uh, I, I just landed over at Bellevue I was kidnapped in the middle of the night out of uh, Channel 6 and uh, joined my uh, two esteemed colleagues uh, I love these guys I've, I've worked on the other side for almost 20 years with these guys, sometimes doing hand-to-hand -hand combat and sometimes just <laughs> trying to shape a story. Um, and uh, first and foremost uh, is, is Pete Peterson, and Pete can talk a little bit about who he is, but he's a guy that, that lives and breathes and eats in, in Delaware uh, County, and uh, he's an incredible resource to, uh, to get to know. Uh, uh, Pete Peterson, I, as Mike said, grew up here in Delaware County, uh, from Springfield originally. Um, I got my involvement in public relations going down and working on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Um, as you heard from a lot of the uh, you know, news directors, um, you know, my goal going to college, I always wanted to be a press secretary for a member of Congress. And so when I graduated, I, I, you know, there's an opening uh, down there as a staff assistant, basically answering the phones and giving tours to the Capitol people. And I just wanted to get down there and you know, get my feet wet and I was very fortunate that, uh, you know, seven months into that, you know, um, a job as the press assistant for the member of Congress opened up, and I was given the opportunity to pursue that. I jumped at it and uh, went on to become press secretary, and I worked down there for 
five or six years before moving back home when I got married and uh, was lucky enough to land at uh, Bellevue. Got to do a lot of what I did down there in DC, a lot of policy uh, and government relations type work um, in the PR realm, of course. Um, but uh, we have a really good team at Bellevue. Uh, it's enjoyable to work with a lot of the uh, PR professionals or former news people we have in our office now. Um, and that really, I think, helps to guide us in terms of determining, you know, is this a newsworthy story? And, you know, what's the best way to pitch this type of event? And we're hoping to be able to share some of that with you. So I'll turn it over to Alex, who also works at our firm. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Steyer. I'm account executive at Bellevue. Uh, I've been there about five years. Uh, I have a non-traditional communications background. Um, I actually graduated from Drexel University in 2006 um, with a degree in music business studies. Um, worked in the nonprofit field, uh, performing arts kind of realm for a couple of years. And like I said, landed at Bellevue five years ago. Um, all of the experience that I had uh, done in my previous work kind of revolved around communications and pitching stories. Um, kind of learned how to write press releases, do some digital media, social media along the way. And uh, opening came up at Bellevue and they were looking for somebody young who had a little bit of a different kind of Skill set, um, again, that was a little bit more geared towards social media and digital media, as this has been a pretty expanding um, scope. So um, Bellevue as a firm has been around for about uh, 17 years now. Uh, and you know, folks like Pete, um, our president, Kevin Feely, also uh, very experienced in government relations, uh, kind of a little one foot in that side of things, uh, one foot in dead set media, uh, a la Mike and a couple of other staff members. So. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great place to work, and uh, like, you know, like we said here, um, we represent kind of all across the board from uh, nonprofit entities, corporate entities. Um, we do, again, digital and social media uh, for some of our clients, and you know, we do also do uh, a fair amount of, you know, like uh, just sort of, that, like I said, that sort of splitting the line between government and public relations. Um, the idea being that we sort of function as an arm uh, when you're trying to influence any sort of policy or legislation from the government perspective, uh, it makes a lot of sense to be influencing public opinion at the same time. So um, that's sort of a, a quick overview of who we are. Um, and, and we did have that last slide, you know, that last line, oh. when it says firing line experience. I mean, we really have firing line experience. And, and sadly for you guys trying to navigate that media landscape, it's just hard for you as a nonprofit or some organization to call into a newsroom and say, Hey, you want to come cover my story? And and it'll take a bunch of it'll take a bunch of no's before you're going to get that 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 yes. And you know it's going to be hard to break through. But today's um, today's typical day in a newsroom, and I, I tell this all the time when I, I go out and do media training. Look, reporters are not sitting in the newsroom saying, "Hey, I want to really go mess this guy up today." You know, I want to go lump up this government agency or I want to go lump up this, this nonprofit. No, they're going in and, and, and they're flying blind because most reporters are general assignment reporters. So they're coming in and they may go from anywhere in the region in the, in the three states that the television stations and the newspapers cover. And so they're coming in sometimes with less info than what you have and you might be able to feed them out on the street. So don't think that just because a reporter shows up at your door that they're there to, to knock your block off. They might just be there because they need insight or you're gonna be the expert or you're gonna provide analysis. So um, if that's the case, um, hit a home run with that. If, if, if they're coming to you for another reason that you know, your group or organization did something negative, then you, know, you better be ready for all the, all the, all the tough questions. Um, but what makes a great story? Obviously you heard it uh, earlier today. I mean, breaking news is king. Um, you know, nothing else gets covered until, you know, the breaking news of the day has been satisfied. Um, so that's a real trouble, you know, that's troublesome for guys like us that are pitching nonprofits or other government related stories that may be further down in the newscast. Um, drama and controversy, good guys and bad guys. Um, but what, what, what everybody wants is that news that viewers, that, that they can use and that, and somewhat of that clickbait. What are, what are people gonna relate to? And most importantly, in the, in the news business, it's all about the demographics, right? So you, we all read and, and, and we all see about, and we all talk about ratings. Well, that demographic that people want to get is the 25 to 54 year old demographic. So if you're 55 and over, 
the news business doesn't want to, they don't, they don't really count you, which is totally, it's, it's crazy because you think 54 and over have expendable income and they're spending money. But the demographic that they're selling to advertisers is the 25 to 54 demographic. And um, so that's the sweet spot. So if you have something that's got a little bit of a social media twist to it or a social component, my God, they're going to they're gonna jump at that. Yeah, and that's a great, I mean, you know, leading off of that, the clickbait concept, um, especially I think in today's media market, um, you really have to think about, I think Eugene made a really good point about the, uh, you know, story that had to deal with, uh, you know, people who are uh, audio or visually and audio impaired and how they're using the internet and how much that hit a specific community that is active and, you know, sharing online. So um, that's just another really important thing to think about nowadays is not only are you, you know, trying to get your story across, but again, thinking about the audience and who are you impacting and, you know, what outlet might be reaching that audience? Because again, I mean, Philadelphia media market, we have four TV stations, we have a couple radio stations, um, your print publications, your major ones, Inquirer, Tribune, um, you know, Aldea, there's a lot of specialty publications, and now there's a lot of online-only publications. So Billy Penn is another one that's covering a lot of local news and doing it in a very unique way that is dead set in that clickbait kind of concept. Um, Philly Voice, exact same thing. Um, it's online only. Um, they're looking to share their stories on social media, and they're looking to build their audience through social media. So again, always kind of thinking about that audience and how that plays out online. So. There we go. Um, that kind of, again, hits right on what I had just said. Um, you know, obviously, YouTube, uh, 1 billion active users per month. Twitter, 320 million active users right now. Um, the idea of, you know, the, where news media is searching for stories right now. Um, you can look and there are specific groups on Facebook where reporters are literally trolling through groups looking for stories, looking for somebody who's complaining about their experience at the local Wawa or something they witnessed and filmed on their video and posted. Um, all that stuff now is fodder for the newsroom. So. And in, in the first three bullet points, what, what, what sticks out? You know what that is? It's free. Yep. It's free. Yep. It doesn't cost big media or anybody any money to go get that. All they got to do is download it and then figure out how they're going to repackage that to put it out. So it's not like hey, we're NBC10 or 6ABC or CBS3, and we're going to fly a reporter and a photographer to San Jose to cover the hurricane. That costs a ton of money. But, I mean, it's important and they need to be there, but that's a fortune. To, so what happens is now you'll see the local affiliates will grab whatever they can off Facebook of somebody in the Delaware Valley who's down there or Twitter or, um, you know, they'll set up an interview over the phone. So, you know, that's where media outlets are looking. Wow, we, can, we, we don't even have to move from our desk. We can, we can go get this. So think about that when you're telling your own story. If you're a nonprofit and you can't fight through some of the, the noise of uh, TV and radio and, and newspaper, you can package your own story on Facebook and Twitter and see if it gets pushed around. And, you know, maybe it lands in somebody's inbox at a station and they're like, wow. You know, and then they may call you and say, uh, you know, you didn't shoot it that great, but we want to come out and kind of reshoot it. Can we do that? And then you're there to say, sure, we'll set it up. What time you want to be here? We'll have everybody, you know, everybody on site. So some of the uh, common misconceptions, um, you know, and some of the clients I deal with, they, they have a negative view of reporters, I guess. They, they think that, you know, the reporters are out to get us. They're, you know, they're just looking to slant the story they want it, uh, the way they want to, uh, you know, frame uh, by and large, that's not the case. Uh, the reporters are, you know, trying to do their job. They're, they've got families. You know, this is, this is their work, and they, uh, you know, you saw what it takes to get to where they are today. They take their responsibilities, you know, for the most part, very seriously. Um, the other, one of the other misconceptions is, you know, well, that's only, you know, a weekly newspaper. That's not that important. I, I don't have to talk to them. Um, Social media has really changed that a lot because you can have a very small, uh, you know, publication as far as, you know, circulation-wise of the print edition, but once it gets posted online and then they get shared and, um, you know, it can spread pretty quickly. So you, you always have to be careful, you know, it has its positive and its negatives. You can't just say, oh, I can say anything I want to this because it's only, you know, the weekly paper. You know, if you make a misstep there, it's just as bad as making a misstep in the Philadelphia Inquirer. 
Um, so, but at the same time, it, it can provide the same advantages as well. And part of the advantage is if you make that misstep, you have an opportunity to correct it. And right. the news media is obligated to correct it. So if they, they have the information wrong, and, and you can make your point that here's, here's you know, you can't argue about, you know, how a quote might be interpreted, but if the facts of a story are wrong, you can bring that to their attention and ask for, ask for a correction, and then they'll, they'll update the uh, online version and hopefully you know, some type of correction goes into the print version as well. Yeah, and you may encounter that more so with some of the smaller publications that may not have the same kind of editorial controls. So you, you do need to be watching, you know, after a story comes out on your organization, you need to go through and, and read those clips pretty much in real time. Um, you know, I go through and I'll, I'll type in, you know, the key search words in Google and I'll do in the past 24 hours. So it'll pull up any new posts on the internet in the past day so I can see, you know, who may have picked this up and then if it's wrong, I call them up right away because you know, that's when it gets posted to the Facebook and you, you want to get the corrections in as quickly as you can, basically. The, um, one of the other misconceptions is that uh, stories are predetermined and that if you ignore a story, it will go away. Um, well, two things. If you're not going to take part in it, then you're not going to get your side of the story in. So maybe it will be pre predetermined, but it's kind of you're making it that way by not participating and not getting your side of the story and are helping to frame the issue the way you want to frame And as far as ignoring the story and going away, they're going to write the story without you um, if you don't participate. So you always want to be involved and making sure that you're um, you know, getting the key messages out. Even if it's a negative story, you want to participate and make sure that your view and your side is being heard. Um, look, we're, it, the reporters, you know, respect that relationship. And, and as you saw today, I mean, these are, you know, they're human beings. They want to do their job. They're like everybody else. Hey, I'd like to try to go home at the end of the day and be with my family and friends and my kids or what have you. But so just respect their deadlines. And, um, you know, it's not personal. It's just their job. And, and I've gone around with Pete and Kevin and guys over at Bellevue, and it's going to be a negative story. And we're like, look, here's, here's your deadline. Here's what you're up against. Here's what we know. And, you know, you ask the PR person or the, or the uh, nonprofit, look, we're going to save a spot for you, and we want you to be included in the story, and it's up to you. And then you have to decide within a short amount of time whether you want to play ball or you don't. And, if, and you can't wait till 10 minutes to 6 to say, oh, by the way, we've been, we've been meeting for hours, and uh, we're probably not going to have anything to say. Really kind of a fatal mistake. So just, you know, if it if it's, involves your organization, jump in right away and just try to, you know, at least try to hold the reporters off for a little bit to say, hey, we're, this is the first we're hearing about it. We're trying to figure out what it is. And then say, look, we will be back to you with something. And, and then, you know, deliver on that promise. Um, respect the deadlines. Re respect exclusivity. So if a station calls you and says, hey, we want to come down and do an exclusive story on this great program you have. And, and you're like, all right, great. But, well, you can't call Channel 10 or Channel 3 the next, in 20 minutes and say, hey, you know, uh, Fox is coming down to do a story. Maybe you guys want to do it. So you got to respect that. That's not a, a fun, uh, fun uh, way to play. Be accessible, and we, we, we talk about this all the time with clients. You know, be, be accessible and, and get that bad news out quickly, but be available as a source. Like somebody may call you just, hey, I want to learn more about funding for this nonprofit group, especially with budget stories coming up now where, you know, the state budget's on fire, right? It's, so you have reporters out there, young reporters, who don't understand how the budget's put together and how it's going to impact your organization. So you may be a source for them, like, oh, here's, how, here's how we get funded, or here's how we're going to be impacted by the state budget if this, if this check doesn't get cashed. Um, and, and that's where we say be a resource, um, even if you don't have a story to sell. Yeah. And Mike uh, said something to me the other day, and uh, really stuck with me about on this very, the kind of be available for bad news as much as you are for good news. And, you know, in our field, um, we book a lot of public affairs opportunities for our executives, um, you know, radio shows, television shows, um, pretty much soft news kind of opportunities. And the idea there is that 
you can look at that as, from your own perspective, practice um, for when things do go bad. So be proactive and you know, be available when there's good news and when you can share that because it's going to make it that much easier when it's time to respond when bad news does come around because ultimately the accessibility option or the accessibility concept is huge there. You have to be available when the news wants you. And the more, you, the more you're practiced and the more you're set from your public affairs opportunities, from you know, any other speaking engagements that you might do, the better you're going to do when the camera's hot and, and the story's hot and you're trying to respond to that. So um, this kind of hits right on what we were saying here. So um, yeah. yeah. You can go through that. There we go. All right. Um, print tips. Know the ground rules off the record. I tell people all the time, and, and, and look, we're in a major market for television and radio and TV. Never, ever, ever go off the record. Because off the record means a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people. So your best bet is when that question comes up, you, you just say, I, I can't answer it. I'll try to find out an answer for you. Um, and unless you're a seasoned PR pro like Pete, you, you just you know, who, who delves in a, in a lot of political circles. I, I would say for a nonprofit or somewhere else, uh, you know, off the record is just never, never a good idea. Um, you know, police, you know, police chiefs and other law enforcement sort, you know, they go off the record, they're fine, that, but they're, they're doing it every day. But you as, a, as an organization, just, just try not to go off the record. It's just not gonna, it's not gonna end well. And um, always be ready for the in-depth questions. Um, you know, have some facts and figures to back up your quotes. Um, and, uh, and if you make a mistake in the interview, and, and if something doesn't sound right in your head, just self-edit. Hey, so-and-so, that didn't come out right. Can I say that again? Can I correct that? You can do that with print and you can do that with TV. So if you're being interviewed and you stumble and bumble over your, over your sound bite, just ask the reporter, hey, can I say that again? Because the last thing a reporter wants to do is put the, you know, especially in a feature story, they're not there to embarrass you or you know make you look like a, a, a fool so they want the best concise 10 to 11 second sound bite so don't ever be afraid to say you know and then make that part of your answer so if you're doing an interview with Vernon Odom or John Rollins or somebody just say hey John hey Vern that sounded that sounded like a mess let me try that again and then just and just gather yourself um, and that's your right to do that that's your right to do that. So don't be afraid to do and that. For, for all of these, I just want to make a couple points. One, uh, one of the things I like to tell people when they're preparing for an interview is to think in threes. Uh, it's called the rule of threes. And our brain is kind of programmed to think in you know, groups of three. We remember three things. You have you know, stop, drop, and roll, uh, faith, hope, and charity. You know, you, so always come up with the three messages you want to get across, not just in print, but also in TV. Um, and everybody should understand that Preparing for print is different than preparing for TV. Preparing for print, the reporters are going to tend to get much more granular and deeper into subject matter. And you have to be prepared, be prepared for that. But at the same time, um, if you don't know an answer to a question that a reporter may have, particularly you know, when it comes to print, just say, hey, I don't have that information right now, or let me check in on that and get back to you. I don't think anybody expects you to be you know, the expert on every, you know, minutia of a certain subject matter. So just going to say, hey, I don't have that right now. Let me check into it. I'll get back to you in the next, you know, hour or two. Um, and they'll respect that. Um, so. Yeah, and, and their deadline is not as tight. So, you know, if you say, hey, I, I'm going to need some time to get that answer, um, you know, but make sure you get back to them. Make sure you call them back and say, geez, I've been looking. I, I really can't find it. Or, you know, I'm going to have to call somebody else. Um, and, uh, and hopefully they'll they can live with that. Uh, TV tips, um, I tell people all the time, maximize your pre-interview time. So when the reporter shows up, hey, how you doing? What, you know, just ask the reporter. Um, not, not specifically like, hey, what are you gonna ask me? But you can ask them, hey, what, what's, the, what's your story? What are you trying to accomplish? What, uh, what's the mission with your story? And you're doing that all kind of off camera. So then you can kind of on the fly, all right, all right, here's their perspective, here's what they want, here's where they're coming from. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to maximize that to just to, to talk to them like, hey, anybody else participating in the story? Or, you know, where are you going next? Or how tight are you on a deadline? And just have some of that, that small talk. I just want to add one other thing to that. There, there's, there's the pre-interview time, then there's the pre-pre-interview time, I would call it. Right. Um, so if you know a reporter's coming out, 
Um, you basically know what their questions are going to be for the most part. You, can, you get a general sense of what kind of, you know, what you're going to be asked. So go in front and go into the bathroom, find some place to mirror, and practice responding to those questions. Um, and it's even helpful to have somebody else in the room because you may, when you say something, it can come across differently or not sound right than opposed to you thinking it in your head. So practice what you're going to say and then listen to it or have somebody else listen to it because what you think you're going to say and what you actually say may be different things, so it's good to get that practice time in. And these are all self-explanatory. Sit or stand up. Um, you can smile a little bit. Always, always look at the interviewer and not at the camera. So, you know, they'll usually, they'll stand you here, the interviewer will be here, the photographer's here. You're always just talking to the, to the interviewer. And, and just try to make it a conversation. Um, and always, you know, always assume you're always on camera. And if it's something, you know, it's kind of dicey, just be careful what you're talking about just in case somebody's rolling. But most of the time they'll say, hey, we're rolling, we're ready. And, um, or you may want to ask if you're doing small talk, hey, you're not recording this, are you? Um, and then that way, you, you just want to raise that, that flag. Yes. Um, you know, dress appropriately. Less jewelry is, is, is always best. Soft colors. Um, you know, I tell people jewel tones. Um, and then men, you know, uh, dark suit or gray suit and, you know, blue shirt. Um, you know, we, you see what they wear, try to, try to emulate what they wear. You, you know, you could wear jeans and uh, as long as they're going to shoot you from, you know, chest up. One other thing on the, uh, the TV interview, just when you're doing TV interviews, unless you're in like a public affairs sit-down format with a host, don't call the reporter by their name during the interview because... I used to work for a member of Congress, and he had an interview with uh, Dan Rather, and he kept calling him Ted throughout the interview, like Ted Koppel. And you could see, it was already a bad interview to begin with, and you could see Dan Rather's face get redder and redder and redder. But, so one, you could mess it up, but, but second of all, um, you know, a lot of times you're going to take that, and they, they may not even have the reporter necessarily in the piece. So if you're using the reporter's name, you basically just rendered that quote unusable. So... Yeah. Don't say the reporter's name yeah. unless it's like a sit-down type public affairs show. I mean, unless you're going to say, hey, that's a great question, Dan, you know, but, right. but I mean, don't drop it into, you know, into the quote or into the soundbite. Uh, radio tips, um, pretty self-explanatory. Always try to use a landline. I know cell phones are great, but there's nothing like a landline to be a, a phone interview. Be conversational. Uh, the other one is refer to callers by name if you're ever on a, a call-in show and you're sitting there in the studio you can refer to the callers by name. Um, and then, um, you know, just with radio, remember that people are listening in their car, they're busy, it's on in the background. Um, and so, so you, you, you have to put yourself in a quiet environment, though, to, to be able to talk to the reporter. Um, and they'll, they'll probably ask you, hey, are you on a cell phone? Is there a chance you can get to a landline? Because it's just, you know, sometimes the quality is a little rough, um, but, but pretty... Uh, Pretty self-explanatory. Alex, you want to um... phone interviews? Um, again, like Mike said, landlines um, always, always important, especially if you're talking about radio. Um, in particular, with radio, they just because you never know what they're going to hear on the other end of the line from a static perspective. Um, removing distractions, um, if you can, if you have a, an office space, uh, you know, definitely close the door, uh, close yourself off from any additional noise. If you have a conference room, um, any other space in your office or you know uh, facility that you can basically get away. Um, distractions, definitely, you, you don't want to have that going on during a phone interview. Um, no cards, nobody's looking at you. Um, a little different from the, you know, print. Yes, you can definitely refer to notes. Television, obviously, much harder to refer to notes. Um, but radio, phone interviews, you always use notes there. Um, for more energy, um, I always like to say that uh, standing helps you kind of emote a little bit more um, versus sitting. And uh, if it helps you again, buy a headset. Um, People like myself, I like to talk with my hands a lot, so it can kind of help me be expressive over the phone and, uh, again, add to that more energy concept. So I just want to jump in on controlling. Sure. So um, when you have the interview, you know, you, you have to sit down and put yourself in the reporter's uh, frame of mind and, you know, ask yourself, okay, I'm reporting on this story. What are the questions that I'm going to ask? That's how you kind of prepare for the interview. Go through and then come up with the answers. And if you don't have them, track them down, make your calls. Be prepared. Um, you know, as I said, develop your messages. You, know, you want to try to make those three key messages. What are the three points 
that you want the readers or the listeners or the TV viewers to walk away with after the news piece runs. Um, understand your audience. Um, you know, the, the audience for print, TV, and radio are all distinct. You know, the, the audience for WHYY is different than it is for KYW. The audience for Fox, even, is different than Channel 6. So understand that you may want to focus on different issues and understand who, you, who, who you're reaching and what they want to hear. Um, remember, that you're the expert. Um, in, in most cases, you are talking to industry publications. You're going to know 10 times more about the subject matter than the reporter. So be a source, explain it, provide details. Uh, one other thing, don't, don't talk in acronyms. I know a lot of us, if you're within a specific industry, you can t tend to start rattling off you know, acronyms. The majority of you know, the viewers or readers aren't going to understand it. And in some cases, the reporter may not understand what you're talking about either. And uh, be aware of the previous stories. I like to go back um, if I get a call from a you know, TV reporter, or uh, sorry, a reporter specifically. I go back and say, okay, what else have they written about this subject matter? So I can see what, kind of what their frame of mind is and what their background is, what their knowledge base is. And I can try to inform their story or know any pre conceptions or misconceptions they may have going to the story. And, and, and Pete's right. Reporter, same thing. It's a general assignment reporter. So they're coming in at 9 o'clock and they're like, they're coming out to Delaware County to do the Delaware County budget, right? And local TV doesn't cover the Delaware County Council, right? So they come out and they're, so what do they do? They go in, they Google and they see, hey, what's, what's Phil Heron written about this? Or what's, you know, Alex Rose written about this? Or somebody else, a, a local reporter who's kind of on the ground. So you have access to that same info. So you're going to know, all right, I got a pretty good indication that he's read, you know, Phil's column or he's read Alex Rose's budget story. So, you know, arm yourself with that same info and, and kind of get a feel of, of what agenda he may be bringing, um, you know, to the interview. Um, and um, every answer should begin on your terms. So look, you know, it's a reporter trap or a clunker. They'll ask you, you know, Hey, this county commissioner budget's a load of, it's kind of a load of crap, isn't it? Well, you don't want to start your answer with, oh, yeah, you're exactly right, John. It is a load of crap, that budget, you know? <laughs> so you want to just kind of pivot off that and be, all right, here's, here's how it's going to affect our organization. Here's how it's going to impact, you know, our, our community. And, uh, you know, just don't, just don't go down that rabbit's hole with, with the reporter. Yeah, it's like, you know, is it true that you beat your wife? And, yeah. You know, like, no, I do not be, you don't even want to say that. Say, you know, I love my <laughs> wife very much. You don't want to, you know, be careful in terms of how, you, reporters will sometimes frame questions in a certain way because they want to elicit a certain response or get a certain sound bite. Um, so just be aware of that and be aware of what you want to communicate, not necessarily what they want you to communicate. And remember, they have to go with what you give them. So you may ask that question of like, hey, you, you know, this budget's really horrendous, right? You're, you're, you're trying to stay away from that. You're just like, so, so you give them your, your 12 seconds, and you give them your three bullet points that you're trying to get out, and, and, and don't go down and, and follow him down that path. Um, Helpful yeah. set of do's and don'ts here, too. So, Alex, go ahead. You can run that off. A quick one. Um, you know, just always an easy, easy kind of uh, diagram that we show to clients. Uh, always be honest and candid. Lead with the positive. We've just talked about that. Um, avoid that negative leading question. Um, control the tempo of the interview. Um, certainly, uh, you know, on that idea of answering the question on your own terms, uh, and you know, not letting yourself get worked up because a reporter is coming at you in a specific way. Um, again, remembering that what well, we come back to—that it's not personal. Um, it's business. Uh, keep your cool. So, don't. Uh, don't think on air. Uh, if you're asked a question on air and you don't know the answer, again, you're more than welcome to say, you know, I'm going to have to get back to you on that or I'm going to have to get some more information. Uh, don't answer questions that are leading, hypothetical, based on faulty premises, technical jargon, as Peter talked about, and don't repeat the negative. Can't say that enough. And just on the always be honest and candid, um, as a public relations professional, um, I think my relationship with a lot of reporters is built on the fact that they can always trust what I say. So once you breach that trust by being misleading, not telling the truth, the reporters can be very suspect about dealing with you in the future. So you know, th that, for me, is the most important thing. Um, yeah, don't ever, ever lie, yeah. whatever you do. I mean, just 
if there's a question you don't want to answer, just, just refuse to answer it. Just, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer, or I don't want to answer that. Just don't make something up or, or mislead them, because it's just, uh, you know, as we tell, uh, you know, reporters bite, <laughs> and they kick. So <laughs> it gets nasty sometimes. Uh, styles, you know, you got different reporters. Uh, some play dumb, they're your friend, they're argumentative. You know, they're a rookie. Um, you know, look, in this climate, you have, uh, you know, you have a lot of young reporters that have been hired at small markets and, and dropped here in a major metropolitan area. And, um, you know, so, so they haven't had a lot of experience. So um, to, to some degree, that's, that's to your credit. But then on the other side, all right, are they, are they coming out to take a bite out of you? You know, hey, I got to make my bones and prove that I belong in the fourth largest TV market. So you got you to gotta weigh that out. Um, you got other reporters that hold you accountable. They deal in rumors. They change the subject. Uh, rumors, you know, the, the easy answer is that's the first I'm hearing about it. Um, you know, just, just don't even go down the rabbit's hole. Just all you can do is control the, the, the 20 minutes that you're going to have to explain your side of the story. So don't get into the rumors and innuendo out there. Um, you know, they may, they may ask you to address it. Oh, we're hearing out in the community this or that. Well, you know, here's what we're hearing. You know, we, we, we live and breathe this organization every day. Here's our perspective. And that's a way to pivot off the, you know, the incoming fire that you may or may not be facing. So um, some of the uh, lures and traps in dealing with reporters um, is, uh, you know, they may ask questions really off subject and not part of your expertise. Um, you know, just be honest, say, you know, I'm here to talk about this, or I can talk to you about this, but I'm not going to get into, you know, that topic at this point. Um, they may say, you know, others are saying, or, you know, the, a lot of people are talking about this, and it's a lure to draw you in, um, very much similar to the uh, hypothetical. And you want to stay on message. You want to you're, you can, you're the one controlling the interview because the only things they can use from you are what you give them. So don't fall into these traps. And, um, you know, you're right. So, look, you just have to know who you're dealing with, right? If Jeff Cole shows up on your door, right, from Fox 29, <laughs> and we all know Jeff's style, right? I mean, he, he's chasing you. Hey, why are you running? You know, well, because I'm selling stolen radios out of a trunk of a car, you know. So, <laughs> so you know, you get that. But, but you know if Jeff's coming or or, you know, Wendy Saltzman, or, you know, say, Chad Berdelli, or, you know, somebody from the investigative unit, you know, they're, for the most part, they're not coming over there to, hey, let's hold hands. And so you got to know what, 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 what you're approaching. You know, you get other guys like the general assignment guys, like Vernon and John and, and, and some of the other folks at Channel 3 or Fox. Look, they're, they're, they're probably just on a tight deadline. Like, hey, they're coming out to see you at 1 o'clock, and they need to be on the air at 4. So... As, as best you can, hey, just, just hit that ball right off the tee into the outfield. Um, so just be aware of, of who's, who's coming after you. Uh, never say no comment. Um, you know, we advise people, just, just don't say no comment. You can say, I, I don't know how to answer that, or let me get back to you with something. It, it, and you might be able to provide it in writing. Yeah. Like, hey, I know, you, I know you like that on camera, but I can't give it to you. Maybe I can shoot you over a quote or something. Yeah, I mean, we, we watch so many news programs, or not news programs, but, you know, su television programs now, and typically when a person says no comment, they're guilty of something. So it's now become associated with that. And you want to avoid making those two words in any way you can. You can say, you know, I'm looking into it, or we're looking into it, or I don't have enough information to talk about that at this point, but don't say no comment. Um, and as Mike said earlier, don't go off the record. Um, you know, I'll do it occasionally with a few reporters that I've dealt with that, you know, have... 10 years experience with, but even then it's, it's pretty rare that I'll do that. And it's only with people that I really have a good relationship with and trust. So generally I'd say, you know, don't go off the record. It's better to assume that anything you tell them could be attributed to you because, you know, that's likely the case in yeah. most cases. I've been in this five years and I've never once done anything off the record with a reporter. So um, yeah. I leave that to the true experts. And, and, and people don't know, you know, sometimes off the record is, I mean, off the record is you can't use this info. And then, you know, you got to go somewhere else to find it. And then you have off the record of, well, I'll give it to you. You can use it, but don't put my name on it. So there's all these nuances. And now you're trying to figure out, oh, what are the rules of the game? And so if you're trying to figure out what are the rules of the game, 
just don't even just don't even get in the game. The it's, other problem, particularly on the print side, is you get a reporter coming in, they're dribbling notes down. I don't know how they read them when they get back to the office. Um, and they go back and they just refresh their memory. They may have forgot that something is off the record. You know? And when did you go back on? Yeah, right, right. and when you yeah. went back on. They're just looking at their notes and they're taking the best quotes out or key facts, and they may forget. It may not even be malicious. So it's just stay away from it. Social media, um, you know, here's the new landscape. You know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Um, so you see all the major TV stations, all the major papers, they all have those platforms, right? Because that's where you are, that's where the millennials are, that's where people are congregating. So as big media, they want to be there too. So, you know, not only now are reporters, they have to go out and, and uh, in a general sense, when people go out and do a story and it's a reporter package, it runs anywhere from a minute to a minute 45. On the radio side, it's probably 40 to 45 seconds. So now reporters are being asked, all right, well, not only do we need you to do two versions of that story or be live at four or five and six with that story, but hey, when you get some downtime, can you file on Facebook and can you file on Twitter? And I just remember doing this with Vernon Odom. Everybody knows Vernon, right? He's a, he's a fantastic reporter, really great guy. And I remember telling Vern, hey, Vern, I'm going to need you to file a Facebook, uh, you know, uh, piece. You, need, you know, and Vernon and Facebook are, you, you know, it might as well be a foreign country, right? <laughs> and so he's like, kid, I was changing your diapers before this all stuff. So, but that's where we're headed. I mean, here's a guy like Vern who's been, do who's been doing this for 40 years. He's got to go now on Facebook and Twitter and... Uh, you know, and it's funny, and you'll see him, and he's trying to Facebook Live himself. And, it, <laughs> and you know, he's, he's getting much better at it, and God, I love him. He's a great guy. Oh. But, but that's what's happening. So then what happens is he's filing a 40-second story on his minute 45-second story, right? And for the millennials out there, that 40 seconds may be the only story that they're going to see. Where you and I, we, we're going to, right, I'm going to watch the 6 o'clock news. I'll see the whole piece. So keep that in mind of, uh, you know, when you're trying to shape your, your own sound bites, but also you can go to that same platform and tell your own story. Yep. And use that as, hey, we're, we're gonna, we have a great feature story here. We're gonna, we're gonna try to figure out a way to package it and put it on Facebook, or we're gonna try to figure out how we can link it on Twitter and then maybe tweet it out or Facebook it out to some of the stations. Yeah, I mean, and nowadays it's, you see it on the Today Show. I mean, they have an entire segment in the morning called The Orange Room, which is literally what is hot, what is happening on social media. And a lot of that stuff is pulled from all of these various sources, but all of that stuff from the news media gets fed into programs like Reddit, which is where a lot of the news media is paying attention right now. Um, when you're looking for a story, you know, trying to kind of elevate, and especially <laughs> nowadays, um, when a local story can be elevated into a national conversation, that stuff all takes place on social media. I mean, that's where, you know, the, the you know, terrible stories about, you know, kids getting harassed in, you know, South Carolina all of a sudden gets injected into a much larger conversation about race and everything, and that's all thanks to, you know, somebody posting a video, photo, whatever it is on Facebook. Somebody else picks it up, shares it into a group. That group shares it into, like, a Reddit post that is, like, you know, hot topic of the day, and then all of a sudden that stuff starts getting upvoted, and you have a story there, and that's what news media people are following. They're following that upvoting concept. And we so. talk about that, and Phil brought this up today. We, we, he mentioned Sunil Tripathi, right? Well, long story short, um, Sunil was the Radner. He, was in, he lived in Radner. Well, initially the story came out that he was the Boston Marathon bomber. Oh, yeah. And... That's right. Um, I had been working, I, I had worked hours and hours, and we debunked the story. And we're like, no, this, you know, photos look similar, but he's not the kid. So uh, um, I remember getting, getting a call at 2 a.m. and from, from Jim Gardner himself saying, hey, do you know this kid from Radner is, you know, might be the bomber? Well, Reddit had put out, yep. and I think some other media outlets had yep. put out through scanner chatter that this kid could be connected. So um, luckily, uh, we at 6ABC, when I was there, we, we didn't go with it. But there were people ready to, you know, pounce on this family. I mean, we were at the house, and we are like, just trying to hold people back. But, but that story took off on uh, social media. And um, I think subsequently there might be a documentary out there 
um, <laughs> on that particular uh, case. And you know, sadly, I think um, I think he ended up, you know, he committed suicide. I think prior to the wow. to the bombing, and they hadn't they hadn't found him. But um, but I, you know, Facebook snackables. That's what I meant to say. So they're yeah, asking reporters slide. to do snackables. That's what they're calling them. So they're 30 to 40 second stories of a of a that that's their mini story, and um, and apparently that's uh, that's the attention span of millennials out there these days. And um, so think of that of like, all right, well, I'm, I'm, I might be down to 40 seconds now for my story. So they say um, nowadays they say Facebook advertisers recommend six seconds now for a piece of video content. So. Um, that just again shows, you know, attention spans are just getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. So. If you get a positive story, you know, put it on your organization's Facebook page, share it. Um, you know, you, people who, you know, already follow you will then like it, and then their friends will see it, and you'll get a broader audience. You'll make the uh, the news people happy because they'll get more, you know, views on the website, which brings in more revenue for them. Um, you know, as was the case with the uh, you know the hearing impaired web browser. You know they're looking to generate traffic to their website. So if you share an, uh, a story with your audience or your membership um, or your employees, and it gets a lot of views. You're more likely to get covered in the future. Um, so be, and you're also helping get the message out that is in those stories. So you really want to take advantage of social media after story runs as well. And right on time, that is 1.30, so um, I don't know if we'll we We'll stick have... around for as long as you guys want. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think we're probably, just to respect everyone's time, um, but I don't know if we, should, we can maybe take a question or two. Sure, you in the back. A very good question. I mean, so... <clears throat> One of the things that uh, most, most papers will post uh, in their websites, typically in the advertiser section, um, something called a media kit. And typically, that's where you'll find that kind of audience demographic information. Papers and their advertising departments are interested in that very same information because that's how they sell their ad space. So for me, um, I'll typically look into you know, for print publications, I'll look for their media kit, and I'll look for demographic information in that. Um, the secondary source, which is a little bit harder from a layman's perspective, but um, in our field we have some TV monitoring services, and so we get some Nielsen reports as well. So you can be able to tell, you know, from a television or a radio perspective, uh, how many people tuned into that particular piece, um, and then certainly circulation, um, and also knowing, you know, what does the paper say about itself, what do the stories say, um, and you know, just looking at the general content, you can get a sense. Um, you know, publications or online only publications like Billy Penn tout themselves as the online only or the mobile first millennial news publication. So, I mean, in a lot of cases, you know, you'll be able to, they'll tell you, you know, they'll tell you what their target market is or they'll tell you who they're speaking to. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, finding the right place to look for it. So. In the others, it's just a mass, you know, ma you know TV's mass, media, the Inquirer. You know, the Daily Times, pretty much mass media. But if, you know, you get into magazines, then it's, you know, it's kind of niche stuff. You know, if, you know, if you're selling wine and you want to be a wine spectator, then, you know, knock yourself out. It's probably unlikely you're going to get in Time or Newsweek. So you just have to figure out where, where you want to. Uh, but most nonprofits, look, you're trying to reach the widest audience, right? So you've got to figure out, all right, how can I get on 3, 6, 10, 29? How can I get on KY Radio, right? And then, you know, the other stuff of, you know, uh, there's generosity and, yeah. and stuff like that that's yeah. more, you know, nonprofit uh, driven. But, but yeah. you know. so one one more question. I'll take from the back. Are you talking about like respond like blog posts like? I tend to ignore them, you know, unless there's a comment section, then you can, you know, rebut the, something if it's really egregious. Um, but, you know, for a lot of times those individuals who run those blogs or those YouTube channels, they're looking for controversy. They're looking, and to the extent that you engage them, 
it gives them, you can fuel the fire in my opinion, and it makes things yep. worse. And I'd say the same thing for, you know, Twitter and, you know, in a way they're all kind of trolls, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, you know? at the bottom yeah. of the story, you ever see the comment? I mean, it's a giant time suck, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. so w what do you care? I mean, unless you're an elected <laughs> official, but even then, you, you're, trying to, you're trying to cut through all the noise of like, is this a real human being or is this some guy, yes. you know, sitting in his underwear in his, in, his, in his basement who's got nothing to do? So, you know, I, I just try to stay out of it and just, all right, here's the story, here's what we can control, and then, you know, I'm not going to worry about, you know, the bottom of the comments from some guy that might be, you know, halfway across the world who has In most cases, opinion. they have an agenda anyway. Yeah. 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 Who I mean, has you're not going to change minds in, right. in those cases. And, for us and don't get into a fight with them. Yeah. Same with a reporter. Like, try not to get into an email or a Twitter fight. Just, you know, just try to pick the phone up with somebody or just have a conversation and with them. So from, from my side, from the digital side, um, we'll always do as, as best we can an assessment of, uh, of a comment or of a threat um, that's coming into you know, an or to any organization that we're dealing with. So um, like you said, if it's a blog post, if it's a YouTube channel, uh, how many followers does that person have? Are they getting any comments on that page? Um, then if you have a name, can you find that person on Facebook? Do they have a following on Facebook? Do they have a following on Twitter? What kinds of other stuff are they posting then too? Because then again, you can gauge whether or not yeah. this someone is a kook, or is this person a credible has a credible beef that they are you know voicing yeah. to your organization. And you don't want to raise so. anybody's profile unnecessarily. Exactly. Don't raise you their profile unnecessarily. You don't want to you know you just don't want to raise their profile. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think uh, we'll be around for some questions afterwards, guys. Um, but thank you so much for listening. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, just a few quick things. I would like to thank Mike and Pete and Alex, and specifically Bellevue Communications. They have been a fantastic partner for the Center for Leadership for several years now. They volunteer their time, and they provide us with expert, uh, as you've seen, um, you know, expert advice. And I, we hope that that's been imparted to you today. Um, on the website, just so everyone knows, the live stream that occurred here will be available for you to download. And it's on the bottom of your agenda, www.newmanpublicsafety.com. Go to backslash course, and the materials will be loaded there as upon, you know, we'll go through and edit. But that'll be completed probably by next week for you. So those materials and resources are available if you need those emails or those phone numbers that we received from our fantastic panel earlier today. So thanks so much, everyone, for your attention today, and have a great day. Yeah. Oh, Dan. Hey, you. thank you. Appreciate Pleasure. It. Yeah, we'll be back.